be submitted before closure of this hearing. Anyone wishing to speak at this public hearing is asked to do one of the following. If you are participating by computer, please click the raised hand button, which can be found in the participants panel on the right hand side of your computer screen. This will indicate that you wish to speak. If you are participating by phone, please press X on your phone's keypad. This will also indicate that you wish to speak. Having indicated that you wish to speak, you will then be placed in a queue until you are invited to speak. All speakers will be restricted to a time limit of five minutes until everyone who wishes to speak has had an opportunity to do so. Anyone wishing to speak a second time may do so by following the same protocol of selecting the raise hand button on your computer or by pressing X on your phone's keypad. To submit written comments, please email them to planning at rdos.bc.ca prior to the close of this hearing. I will now ask Christopher Garish, planning manager, to outline the specifics of the proposed bylaws. Go ahead, please, Chris. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, for the public hearing today, it is in relation to uh, the two bylaws, one bylaw 2800 and the official community plan amendments. I've just got some quick background and overview of some of the changes I've run through. Um, so, the, the project context is the South Okanagan electoral areas, so that's A, C, D, E, F, and I. Uh, they're the ones shown here on the map in green. Um, it's, uh, it's basically proposing a consolidation of the six existing zoning bylaws for those electoral areas. Uh, these zoning bylaws were prepared at various points in time between 1998 and 2006. Um, and were all repealed and reenacted in 2008, largely unchanged. So it has been a number of years uh, now since they were first adopted. And as a result, uh, some of them have been subject to numerous amendments. The example I have here is Area D, which has had, I think, 50 plus amendment bylaws uh, to their zoning bylaw. And uh, just to reemphasize too, that this has been a business plan for the regional district, or in the business plan, sorry, for a number of years now. And the benefits that we see with the project uh, incre include increased uh, or improved ease of access by the public and staff with a single updated bylaw, uh, reduced inefficiencies and duplication and overlap between the electoral areas, and also improved coherence uh, within the bylaw through the removal of internal inconsistencies and conflicts. So I'll just move now to like a, a very brief overview of some of the more significant changes within the bylaw. Of course, keeping in mind that over the last five years, we have run uh, numerous uh, zone reviews and regulation reviews, which have already been incorporated into the electoral area bylaws. But um, within 2800 itself, uh, there is a change in relation to the landscaping and screening regulations as they're being proposed that those not be carried forward, uh, that landscaping now be addressed through development permits in the future. Uh, the signing regulations are being expanded given their own section and there's also proposing minor increases for uh, farm signs. Uh, the nuisance regulations, uh, i.e. exterior lighting, uh, are being proposed for removal. Uh, they're not actually a, a power under the zoning authority, they fall under a different section of the Act. Uh, occupancy of a second dwelling, um, proposing to replace the requirement for a covenant uh, with a decommissioning plan and also a security deposit in the amount of $25,000. Uh, for recreational vehicles, uh, the allowance for one RV belonging to a guest or a visitor uh, be applied to the RA, AG, large holding, small holding zones, and that the occupancy limit be maintained at 90 days in a calendar year, but this be between the May, months of May and September. Uh, swimming pool set and setbacks, just uh, some clearer or clearer language uh, on where swimming pools can be placed on a parcel. Uh, the maximum parcel coverage in the ag zones for area C is being brought into line with the other electoral areas. Uh, there's a maximum density change in the OK Falls Town Centre. It's being proposed to increase from 100 units per hectare to 150 units per hectare. Floodplain management, a couple of changes here. Uh, again, clear language around how we apply the regulations to dwelling units. Um, there's an existing provision that's not quite consistent across electoral areas, so we're proposing to address that by um, have it only apply to dwelling units on parcels in the ALR greater than eight hectares in area. And there's also a, a longstanding exemption that dates to 1982 um, that we think has been the subject of a drafting error at one point. So we're proposing that this be removed uh, from the bylaw. And then finally, uh, with regard to the OCP amendments, uh, the text amendments to the OCPs are largely to change references to zoning bylaws that would no longer exist. Uh, there are some proposed map changes, and that's generally to support um, the zoning bylaw uh, with consistency. 
And I've got just one example here of the map change to the OCP, and it's uh, from Area C, and it just shows the um, the change in designation of Park Real Creek uh, from uh, agriculture to conservation area zone. So that, that's the kind of uh, changes in the OCPs. Uh, and that's it for my presentation, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you for that, Chris. I will hereby declare the public hearing open and ask if there is anyone who wishes to speak to the, to the proposed bylaws. <clears throat> I'll ask a second time if there is anybody who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaws. Are you seeing any hands, Danny, that I may be missing? Okay. I'll ask a third and final time. And I'll also remind anybody who is listening, if they wish to submit anything in writing, to please do so immediately <laughs> before I close this. So last call, seeing no hands or X's from phone in folks, I will hereby declare the public hearing closed at 9.08. And thank you for that. So moving on, I believe the first committee meeting we have on the agenda is environment and infrastructure. And I believe Director Bush is going to chair that for us today. So please go ahead, Director Bush. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so this morning, I'd like to call a meeting for environment and infrastructure committee to order at uh, what time is it? 9.09. .09. And I'd like to ask for a motion to adopt the agenda, please. Okay, moves. Second. All in favor, any, any opposed? No, okay, so motion carries. Thank you. So this morning we have a delegation from OASIS and I'd let uh, CAO introduce Lisa. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So yeah, there's the uh, uh, Okanagan and Smilkamine Invasive uh, Species Society is here to present their uh, previous year's activities and updates and then answer any questions that committee may have. So we do have Lisa Scott, uh, who's been with us uh, in this capacity for a long, long time, and uh, obviously an expert in, in uh, what she does. So we'll turn this over to Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We do. Excellent. Okay, I will just share my screen. All right. Can everyone see my screen with the uh, summary um, covered there? Excellent, okay. Um, thank you um, for the welcome this morning and I appreciate the opportunity to be a delegation to provide an overview of uh, our activities and results um, from the 2021 fiscal year. Thanks, Danny. He's helping me out here. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Danny, I'll be able to advance the slides now. It wasn't letting me. There we go. Excellent. All right. Well, it was uh, a second year of um, dealing with the pandemic for all of us, of course. Um, so um, 
we it did impact um, our program to a certain extent. Of course, we did have to establish protocols and a risk assessment as well as a response plan, which we did have to put into play a couple of times with um, some suspected COVID cases. But fortunately, um, none of our staff did catch COVID and um, we had a healthy year. It did impact a lot of our interactions, of course, and there were uh, much fewer um, community events and uh, somewhat reduced um, direct contact with private landowners, but it was still uh, um, a very fruitful year with lots of successes that I'll be talking about today. Um, what it really did mean, uh, as it did for, um, for you as well as a board, is many things were moved to an online platform that typically would have been uh, achieved face-to-face. -face. And I'll touch on that during my presentation. So as a reminder to everyone, um, we are a, a region-wide program with uh, 20 or more funders in any given year. And of course, in addition to that, um, at least that same number again of, of partnerships of many organizations who may not provide direct funding, but they're part of the decision-making process um, they're, they're part of the program. It's very much a collaborative effort right across the regional district. Um, our emphasis remains on invasive plants. Uh, approximately 80% of our budget goes towards invasive plants. Um, but we also address, uh, as many of you know, we've been working very closely for many years now um, with the Okanagan Basin Water Board uh, trying to keep invasive mussels out of the Okanagan. Um, we have also work with um, invasive clams now. Um, we don't believe we have them here, um, but if you don't monitor, you don't know. So we've been um, diligently doing surveys um, along Osuyas Lake. Um, and we deal with emerging species as well. And from my perspective, the emerging species really all relate to insect pests and um, that very colorful insect you see on the the bottom right of of your slide there um, that spotted lanternfly that's a new species to put on your radar it is not yet known to occur anywhere in canada it's a federally regulated species so if it does arrive um, CFIA will be involved among other partners. But this one, um, this insect pest uh, followed a similar path as the brown marmorated stink bug, which we do have here. Um, they both uh, love the tree that you see here, which happens to be an invasive tree called Tree of Heaven. Um, it's a preferred host species, but they also love grapes and fruit trees. And in Pennsylvania, this little guy has caused impacts of up to 90% devastation in vineyards. We do not want it here. So um, as I mentioned, our efforts are really um, not shifting, but we're enhancing what we do when it comes to raising awareness about insect pests like the spotted lanternfly. So getting down to some of the statistics for last year, um, again, we do work in all of the electoral areas with our partners. We provide assistance to all of the municipalities with our summer staff. And here's our, our two students from last year, um, Megan and Luca, um, another excellent team. Um, and they did uh, work throughout the regional district um, doing inventory, manual control, and also um, some surveillance for those insect pests. Um, overall, our team of summer students, um, an in-house uh, crew of two, as well as a, a certified spray contractor, we targeted 29 species throughout the region. We treated, uh, chemically treated, a total of 25 hectares uh, and a total of 964 treatments. And we mechanically treated um, 278 sites covering a total of eight hectares. And I'm really excited to say, and um, I'm gonna start reporting more on this every year because this is, 
This is what we want to see. We had 281 sites that we surveyed with no plants found. Um, and just to be clear, if we find no plants at a site where we previously had invasive plants and we go one year, we don't just think our job's done and walk away. We there is a formula depending on the invasive plant we're targeting there, and we have a set number of years where we will continue to monitor and revisit that site to ensure that we did indeed um, have successful removal from that site. So the next few slides, I just want to highlight um, some of the projects and partnerships uh, that we've been involved with. Um, this is our, this was our second year uh, at Heritage Hills Garnet Park, a regional district uh, managed park. Um, we were first introduced to this park in 2020 and spent an entire week and um, I think close to triple the number of hours from what you see here. So we obviously feel really good about um, what happened in year one. So reporting out on year two last year, 70 person hours. Um, we did a combination of chemical and mechanical treatments at the park. Um, you can see the scotch thistle, that's that kind of glowy prickly plant on the bottom left image before and after. Um, so a combination of chemical and mechanical treatments, you can see the total hectares there, um, 0.3 hectares. Um, for each type of treatment and the mechanical treatment, so where we were digging or cutting plants, a total of 100 kilograms of weeds removed. But to put that in perspective, that was a 93% decrease from 2020. So much less biomass um, from the previous year. Um, so we're pretty excited about what we're seeing up in this park and of course we will put it on our radar um, for the current year um, and I'm sure we'll just continue to see um, in ongoing improvements and successes there. I wanted to highlight a new partnership and um, we have of course worked with the District of Summerland for many years but um, in 2021 was the first year we did a fee for service project. Um, we were um, brought on by the by the district to target the white flowering plant you see um, on the roadside here in this image. It's called Hori Alyssum. Um, I know the uh, the directors from Summerland will be very familiar with this plant. It's definitely um, been discussed uh, at the political level more than once. This invasive plant is in the mustard family and it uh, you can see in this particular image in the background we have a hay field and this is the problem. When this plant moves into um, pastures or hay fields the big concern is the impact to horses. It can cause a um, toxic reaction to horses and to the point of actually causing death. Um, so this has been, um, it has been in Summerland and other areas of the region for quite some time, but it's really been shown to be on the move. So we worked very closely with the district uh, staff, um, brought in contractors as well as our own staff to target this plant. Uh, we did a very detailed inventory of all agricultural areas and came up with a total of 95 locations where this plant infests the roadsides or has moved onto the land, whether it be private or municipal land. And we developed uh, an integrated approach and we delivered on that approach. Uh, in 2021. Um, so by an integrated approach, it means we, we looked at all the different tools available. We worked with the um, district staff where we encouraged areas where they should enhance their roadside mowing. Our summer students did manual removal. And then we also had a contractor do um, uh, chemical spot application. And in our plan, we provided recommendations for 2022, um, which would be some ongoing treatments as well as some door to door contact to encourage the reciprocal treatment on private lands.
So this is just one example I wanted to highlight of some of the work that we do upon request um, from our partners, such as the District of Summerland. Um, we have also enhanced our engagement with um, First Nations communities. Um, and this is particularly important in our uh, highly sensitive and um, important, culturally important areas, uh, such as White Lake Basin, where this photograph was taken, where we were working with um, a traditional ecological um, knowledge keeper. We have a, a pilot project happening in the White Lake Basin. We're in year three of that project. Um, so we want to work closely with, in this case, um, we've worked with three bands and they've appointed the Penticton Indian Band to maintain ongoing contact with us. And we're working very closely with uh, the Nature Trust, provincial government, um, the uh, range user, the observatory, and many other partners in this particular location. Um, and I'm really excited about the work that we're uh, doing uh, in this particular year, um, a very enhanced project with the Penticton Indian Band. And um, I'll be excited to report on that later this year or this time next year. Also wanted to draw to your attention some of the targeted work that we do with residents uh, of the regional district, what we refer to as door to door contact where we're literally door knocking. Um, we obviously can't do this in all locations. We focus our efforts on high priority treatment locations um, where we are doing work um, on the road right of way in partnership with the Ministry of Transportation. Um, and we see the invasive plants on the adjacent private land. So it doesn't make any sense for us to continue to put public dollars on the road right of way if we're not encouraging the reciprocal effort on the private land. We don't have any jurisdiction there, so it's very um, strong encouragement um, and incentives where we can to, um, uh, to assist private landowners in, in taking the required actions so we get a, a much more uh, effective response to dealing with the invasive plants. So two key areas, um, Area H, we've been tackling Horealism again, already mentioned with Summerland. Um, it's uh, problematic in um, the Princeton area and we've done door-to-door -door contact along Old Headley Road. Um, and we've also been working um, with residents uh, in Area I and maybe just squeaking into Area C along um, Green Lake Road, just outside of OK Falls, where we've been working very diligently to reduce an invasive plant called blueweed. Of course, um, we talk about an integrated approach and that becomes very important when it comes to um, working cooperatively with our organic growers. Um, we've had a lot of success over the years in the Coston area where we know that's um, a very um, uh, high number of orga organic growers in that region. And we've been very successful to be effective with our um, puncture vine uh, treatment in that, that area. Um, we've had more challenges in um, along the Black Sage Road area um, and that's where this photograph was taken. Um, we've been working very closely with the growers who um, are either currently organic or transitioning to organic because we do have a very significant problem with puncture vine and long spine sandbur in these regions. Um, so that's an ongoing project, um, but I just wanted to highlight that for you where we're really trying to seek some creative solutions to um, provide some courtesy in those areas adjacent to the organic growers um, and also provide them with advice and solutions so um, we can all meet the same endpoint uh, and also be effectively managing the invasive plants on the roadside. 
So that uh, is a summary of the treatments and the approaches we take and then very briefly um, some of the digital outreach work that we've been doing. Um, this past year was a big year for us. It was our 25th anniversary. And one of the things we did was we created a, a new website. So I encourage you to go to oasis.ca if you haven't been to our website. Um, I'm really proud of what we've done there. Um, we have all our links to our different uh, social media platforms, including um, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We really enhanced our videos last year. I think this is an important direction to go. Um, we can provide information um, to viewers on how to identify and manage invasive species through the videos. Um, but of course, um, we continue to put pictures and posts and share messages through uh, Instagram as well as Facebook. And the image you see here of this poor boy with the blisters on his face, um, this was spring break last year. This was um, a couple of young children interacted with one of the invasive plants in the Spurge family, Myrtle Spurge. And um, this post, if you can see it there, it got, um, in the end, I think it got over 600 shares. We reached an audience of 50,000 people. Um, it continued to go viral throughout the spring and summer of last year. Uh, it's a toxic plant that can cause skin irritations, blisters, um, pain, uh, pain and, and redness. And uh, it just shows the important role that social media can play. Um, when it comes to educating the public um, and encouraging them to take action and be more engaged. We continue to support an additional website, which I've talked about before, OISO, Okanagan Invasive Species Online. Um, this uh, came about through the Climate Action Initiative a few years back. This is to support the agricultural sector throughout the Okanagan Valley. So this is a partnership with all three regional districts. There is financial support provided by yourselves. And we're continuing to encourage um, financial support from the other two regional districts as well. It's a one-stop shop for everything invasive in the Okanagan Valley. And we have an app as well, um, so people can easily report in, send photographs, um, but all of that information does come to OASIS. So we are the, um, the managers behind this, uh, this website as well. Very briefly, our aquatics program. Um, we did have three summer students again. We circulated a, a digital package um, to uh, uh, businesses throughout the Okanagan Valley. We reached out to approximately 200 businesses and half of them requested this information. Um, this is to pro provide them with information, handouts that they can print, share on their websites, share on their social media platforms. Um, we continued our boat launch surveys and lake monitoring that we've been doing for um, approximately 10 years now. Um, we did complete the two-year uh, citizen science project through the RBC Tech for Nature. This is money that was administered by the regional district yourselves. Um, so you were able to retain the administrative funds for that. Um, and then we carried forward in this two-year project and we have reapplied and not yet heard for another two-year uh, expansion of that project. Um, we got a lot of social media coverage and really pleased with the success of this program. So just my last couple slides, I'm just gonna highlight um, for you the results of the feedback that we get, what we refer to as our landowner or land manager contact. So because we put ourselves out there and we encourage people to connect with us for more information, um, I keep a spreadsheet of everybody that contacts me, how they heard about us, what their questions are about so that this can help um, 
provide us with direction for future years on where we need to um, expend our, our, our funds. Um, so here you can see that 93% of the inquiries are about invasive plants, 4% on aquatic invasive species, two on insects and one general. And the sources of information, um, more than half, um, well, I guess I'll go through about one quarter are people that are familiar with OASIS. Um, there are our partner organizations. Um, uh, one quarter is a referral where somebody's encouraged them to contact us. And um, the other uh, uh, almost quarter is somebody who's connected with us in the past and they are seeking further information. And then from there, 13% are through social media or our website. 8% based on news articles. Um, a lot of that is, uh, you know, Castanet, uh, Penticton Now, other sources. And then 2% um, direct contact, and that's that door to door. They followed up with us or they attended an event 2%. So this is really useful information for driving um, where we do our work um, in future years. And here's just an overview across the regional district. Um, obviously, Summerland and Penticton are hotspots for inquiries. Um, but you can see essentially through the we do get inquiries right across the board from throughout the regional district. Um, those graphics that I've just gone through the last three, I did prepare a handout. I'm not sure if it was circulated yet. If not, we'll make sure you get it that goes through all the stats and the graphics that I just shared with you. Um, as I mentioned, um, this was our 25th anniversary. So we're now entering our 26th year. This was me back in 1997. Um, we are still um, battling a war with our invasive plants, um, but we've expanded that now to other species. But I, I have to say I'm, I'm really proud of where we've come um, over the last 25 years, and I'm excited to see we can, where we can go moving forward with our expanded partnerships and projects. Thanks very much for your time today. Um, and if there's time, I'm, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, directors, do we have any questions for Lisa? Hey, seeing none, is there any in the boardroom that I can't see? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Uh, Lisa, I have a question regarding uh, brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, when there's sightings, should they be reported? And if so, is there anything that can be done to control the spread of them? Thank you for your question, Director Bush. Um, yes, most definitely. Um, brown marmorated, brown marmorated stink bug. Wish it was a shorter name. Um, has been found to occur throughout the regional district, both in the Similkameen Valley and and in the Okanagan Valley. The hot spot is downtown Kelowna, but it has been shown to spread into some of our orchards, mainly in the Mission area. But it hasn't. It's not considered established yet, which is fingers crossed. Good news. So any reports um, should go to. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture, the Kelowna office, um, or they can come through me and, and I can funnel it there. But um, it's really important to take a picture, but almost more important is to collect a sample. There are some really similar looking stink bugs. Um, so collect a sample, an unsquished sample, <laughs> just in a little um, vial or even a plastic bag. Um, and report it where you found it and when. As far as control options, um, unfortunately, they are limited at this time. Um, but um, so we're just the messenger, but Ministry of Agriculture is working with the Federal Agricultural Department to uh, look at direction of where to go with this um, particular insect pest. Okay, thank you very much. You're um, welcome. 
seeing no other um, questions, I think we'll move oh. on. To... There's one question. Tim, Go ahead. Director Roberts. Go ahead, Tim. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I was waving frantically earlier, but uh, I think I'm hidden in my trees. Uh, a question whether or not and what kind of support and uh, cooperation do you get with the Ministry of Transport in regards to alleys, boulevards and highway roadsides uh, in regards to invasive um, plants and the management thereof? Thank you for your question, Director Roberts. Um, the Ministry of Transportation is um, provides um, the most funding out of all our partners. We um, have received, or we are apparently about to receive, we don't have a contract yet for the current fiscal year. I've been told it looks like it's status quo, which is $110,000 um, for the uh, doing work in the RDOS. So that's complete. That's treatment, administration, outreach, and education. They do have some requirements that we need to address in there, a certain Percentage of that money has to be spent in gravel pits, for example. Um, the Ministry of Transportation does not specify um, outside of that, um, like any particular streets or locations. Um, you mentioned alleyways, which alludes to municipalities. So within municipalities, we do not spend uh, Ministry of Transportation dollars. Um, yeah, did you want to add to that? Sorry. Uh, thank you. In electoral areas, our communities aren't municipalities and we um, all the jurisdiction for alleyways and boulevards, et cetera, are all on the Ministry of Transport. And wherever we have an overgrowth of weeds and that that's not RDUS land, it's all Ministry of Transport. So concerns around communities like Olala, Headley, um, where they'll have a buildup of weeds and invasive plants in these unmaintained alleys and uh, roadsides. Hmm. Thanks for clarifying, Director Roberts. Um, I think that's a really good um, question worth exploring. Um, perhaps you and I could arrange a field day to go out and take a look at some of these locations. I could try to arrange to have a Ministry of Transportation rep come as well. Um, right now, we are in the process of working with all of our partners in what we call a planning committee format, where we make kind of broad based strategic decisions on where the pooled funding will be spent, but obviously each funder has specific criteria and mandate that we need to meet. So as with any pooled funding, it's a balancing act, but I think it's important and that's our role through OASIS is to um, hear the concerns from um, the constituents, um, from yourselves, and to try and work with our funding partners to address salute, to address those and come up with solutions. So, um, yeah, let's let's uh, talk about that and, and get together in the very near future. Um, I think the invasive trees is going to be an ongoing um, issue. Um, and with the invasive trees come the invasive insects. So um, I would just say stay tuned to everybody. Um, I think we're hopefully gonna see some changes and um, a, maybe a bit of a shift in our um, target species over the coming years. Okay, again, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, any final comment? Okay, seeing none, um, I think we'll move on to uh, delegation regarding sustainable fleet infrastructure. CAO? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, we do have Jeremy Dresner available. Uh, we were fortunate enough uh, a year or so ago to uh, qualify for funding from under Fortis BC for uh, energy specialists to come into local government and assist uh, with the development of programs. And Jeremy has been with us uh, for about a year now and very uh, successful in uh, moving us forward and acquiring grants uh, to support that. Uh, he's here with a colleague from Fortis BC and they're going to give uh, committee an update 
on the electric vehicle charging infrastructure and a gap analysis they want to do, and then uh, some prioritization uh, for uh, fleet management as well. So uh, we should just turn it over to Mr. Dresner, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, I presentation available there. Okay, can't see it. Um, well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be able to present here in person. Um, just wanted to briefly go over uh, these are some of my areas of work here and um, electric vehicles, renewable natural gas, community energy, corporate energy, street lights, and step code. These are some of the areas. I've been working on, and if we go to the next slide, please. Um, today, we're going to be talking about three of those areas, EV, corporate energy, and community energy. Um, I'm also presenting today with uh, Drayden Power from Fortis BC, who's on the line as well, and you'll be hearing from him a bit later. Drayden is, uh, are, you, are you there? You're to just quickly introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Drayden Power. I work for Portis BC. I'm the manager of EV infrastructure and investment. I've been working with Jeremy on various uh, rebate and incentive streams as well as just general information on installing EV infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just gonna start with a really brief video that we made uh, with the city of Kelowna and regional district of central Okanagan. Um, it's on the uh, on YouTube if we're able to bring it up. And it's uh, about electric vehicles in the region. To many, the Okanagan has always been about adventure. And with any good adventure, days can be wild. Spontaneous. And long. And while the adventure may be unknown, the drive will be sure, secure, energized, peaceful, and clean for generations of adventurers to come. Okay, so that video was made. Uh, if you struggle to lose weight, with support from Emotion <laughs> and plugin VC, which is from the Fraser Basin Council. Fifty nine pounds of fat. We could lose the YouTube now. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so moving on, I wanted to talk about the uh, new public charging infrastructure which has gone in in Naramata. This is currently a, a story in three parts. There is Wolf Park, that is the before, during, and uh, current state of the public charging infrastructure there. Um, we are waiting for spring to come around. Uh, in a few weeks' time, we'll be able to put the asphalt and complete, the, uh, <laughs> complete the installation. I'm not sure if I can be seen online. Or they can't <laughs> see you, but good to go. But um, yeah, those two charges, uh, both 50 kilowatt each, and they were planned last year. And I'm going to hand over to Drayden for the next slide, uh, who will be able to speak a little bit more to those public EV charges. Drayden. Thanks, Jeremy. So, yeah, as you mentioned, we just finished up the two 50 kilowatt chargers in Naramata. Those are considered DC fast chargers, highway grade. They'll be able to charge a car relatively quickly, the, more, the modern cars that are out there today. Pretty soon, we will also be installing a couple new stations in Carameas and Princeton. Currently, BC Hydro operates a site in Carameas and a site in Princeton. We will be swapping with them, so we'll take over ownership. And then later this year, we'll actually add an additional 100 kilowatt charger at each of those sites. So by the end of the year, we will have one 50 and one 100 kilowatt uh, DC fast charger at each of the Carameas and Princeton sites, which is pretty exciting. I was also just going to talk about rates for a minute at these stations. So we had a five-year interim rate from the BCUC, the regulator, uh, it's, uh, it was the longest interim rate in our company's history. 
but it, it ended well. On November 30th, 2021, we received approval for a permanent rate for DC fast charging stations. Our interim rate was 30 cents a minute. And again, you have to bill on a permanent basis right now because the way the regulation works, it does not allow level two or level three chargers to be billed on actual consumption, like a kilowatt hour basis. You have to bill on a minute per minute connected basis. So before the approval, it was 30 cents per minute. Now after the approval, the price has actually gone down for most of our chargers, which are 50 kilowatt. It's now 26 cents per minute. And our 100 kilowatt stations, our high power ones, are 54 cents per minute. So our high powered stations are found throughout uh, our service territory, going from Kelowna down through Oliver, Soyuz, Caramus, and Princeton soon, um, Rock Creek, Greenwood, and so on and so forth out to the Kootenays. Uh, so that you'll, if you're driving along the main corridor to get from one tip of our service territory to the other, you will be able to charge at at least a 50, but most likely a 100 kilowatt fast charger. Uh, okay, I'm ready. So the next thing I was going to bring up is just the funding stream. So there's there's lots of money out there today from provincial and federal governments looking to get EV infrastructure in the ground. So the three streams that I've been working with Jeremy on is the federal funding called the Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Program. There's two ways that this will reach our pockets and be able to help us install EV infrastructure. The first is through a straight ZEBIP application that Fortis BC is working on with Jeremy, with RDOS. The intent here is that we have approval to deploy. The next slide will show you, no, don't worry, we'll jump in yet, a number of chargers that we're going for applications straight from ZEBIP to get funding to do so. The second way that the federal funding could hit us is through the Clean BC program. So the provincial funding program is called Clean BC. The Clean BC Go Electric program provides funding for workplace, fleet, single family homes, MERBs. If any of you have installed a charger uh, in the last couple of years, I hope you've taken us up on our rebate program. If not, feel free to call me and I can walk you through it. Um, but the provincial program has recently received a top up from the federal government through ZEBEP for an additional fund through there. So. Long and short, there's provincial and there's federal funding. On top of that, Fortis BC is actually looking into releasing our own incentive program right now outside of the municipal and federal and provincial funding program. This would offer charging or a rebate for chargers based on a minimum take or pay requirement. You have to consume a little bit of energy for us to justify the cost to give you some money. So we're just working through the regulatory process right now on getting that approved, but we hope to have it live by the time that a lot of these chargers are going in in the RDOS area. If you want to jump to the next slide, I'll pass it back to Jeremy. Speaking exclusively about fleet use just at the moment, um, for that fund uh, that was just mentioned, the, uh, the federal fund, we had, to men we had to list a few likely locations for chargers, and that's the list you're seeing here. These are likely locations for fleet-only use. And I just want to talk about fleet for a bit, and then we'll come back to community charging. Um, often you're not able to, to share charging resources that easily. Um, if we can just go on to the, to the next slide for a second. Uh, thank you. Um, we are, we've just started a fleet assessment of our, our fleet. And uh, this is involving putting a monitoring device on every vehicle, all 42 vehicles, understanding just in the round after, after six months what their distances traveled are, their return to base, things like that. Um, installs are going on yesterday, today, in those devices, and we start uh, the monitoring process after that. Uh, we're looking at fuel savings, cost savings, more predictable pricing for fuel, and of course, understanding what our potential is for GHG reductions. Um, next slide, please. And um, basically, we are looking to measure all of these um, aspects and doing that full duty cycle analysis of their fleet use will help us determine which vehicles are suitable for electrification in the future. We need to really get high quality data in before we can start making that decision. And uh, we received uh, $10,000 for Plugin DC to, to launch into this. Um, I've also spoken with uh, Summerland and Penticton, who are in various stages of doing their own fleet analysis, as well as uh, Oliver. Um, and uh, I spoke with uh, Asuyas as well, and uh, Princeton. Different municipalities were in different stages of their own fleet analysis, but my general aim was to try to do as much 
combined as possible because I think in the future there may be efficiencies with uh, sharing, uh, purchasing of vehicles and looking to, to be efficient in the way that vehicles are uh, moved around the region. So that's all to be determined. And first things first, let's get the data in and understand our, our routes and our, our cycles of those uh, vehicles. Um, next slide, please. So what's the outcome of this study going to be? It's going to be a review of the existing fleet. It's going to provide recommendations for electric vehicles, um, an overview and recommendation for electric vehicle charging infrastructure, a roadmap of a phased approach to EV adoption, energy analysis of current operations, energy and GHG impacts that we would benefit from with EV adoption, and a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we doing all of this? Um, there's a lot of reasons, but this one will be clear to anyone who uses a vehicle. Um, that's the 18-month average price of gas that we've seen. Um, next slide, please. And here is what we spend on fuel in the regional district on, on diesel and gas. Um, so you can see, just by standing still, we spending a lot more on fuel. And um, we uh, don't know how 2022 is going to pan out, obviously, but uh, indications so far are that we're going to be spending a lot more this year again. Um, now, gas costs have risen 54% from 2019 to 2021. Uh, next slide, please. And um, I just wanted to highlight that electricity prices, and these are the prices you would pay to charge a vehicle, um, are much more stable and predictable. They've risen in five years, 5.9%. And the demand charges have gone up 30%. So there's definitely a comparison to be made just in terms of predictable pricing and um, managing our fuel consumption uh, by looking at EVs. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Danny. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to see this report that only came out a few weeks ago, but it basically looked at a number of different vehicles that you might choose, looking at their electric and gas equivalents. And uh, that was based on 2021 gas prices too. Every single vehicle they looked at, assuming an eight years of ownership and more than 20,000 kilometers annually, was cheaper on the electric version based on a total cost of ownership. Um, and uh, as they say, if gas prices stay above 2021 levels, the savings are going to be greater still. So um, people often ask me, when is the time to switch? And the evidence seems in, in many cases like it, it might be now. Now, we're doing a study. It's quite simply not going to be that every vehicle is ready. And it's not, I'm not saying that we should transition every vehicle right now. So I'm not saying that at all. And I don't want to prejudge what the study is going to say. But in many, many cases, the, the case is already um, is good economically looking at that total cost of ownership over the lifetime of the vehicle. Um, next slide, please. And uh, the other reason we're doing this is because EVs are already happening. Um, just last month, the federal government mandated an even tougher schedule, mandating one in five new passenger vehicles to be battery operated by 2026. 60% by 2030 and 100% by 2035. BC leads the way. We already have 13% of all light vehicles on the road registered last year were EVs. And in Canada overall, 11.8% were EVs, hybrids, or um, some other low carbon fuel. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to talk about two concerns that you often hear um, about EVs. One is that there are not many models available, and uh, they're not the right type of vehicles. Well, um, that is changing, and you can see from this, this data in the next two years, there are many, many more models that are going to be released that are currently available. A lot of manufacturers are switching to produce, uh, provide EVs of various types. And second, uh, next slide, please. Second major concern is often about range anxiety. <coughs> so all fair enough concerns. I just want to give two example journeys that we might make in the regional district to the very uh, furthest distances from, from here. And as you can see, with the proposed F-150 Lightning and the proposed Chevy Silverado, uh, based on their listed ranges, they can do uh, those journeys and back on their, on, without even having to recharge. So um, again... <coughs> An EV is not suitable for all situations, not for all uh, uses, 
but there are technology, what was true <coughs> two years ago is not necessarily true today, and technology is moving very, very rapidly with these things. Um, next slide, please. So having, having uh, <coughs> got some uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure in already and looking at our fleet, I wanted to really focus on community EV charging. It's a, a topic we, we hear a lot about. And um, what I'm proposing is that we embark on a report from uh, the Watt Consulting Group. They've done reports for the Capital Regional District on the island. They're doing a report uh, for the city of Kelowna. And they will do a thorough study of uh, residential density, land use, uh, look at the current traffic patterns and look at all the um, areas that may be suitable for and, and well used for community electric vehicle charging. Um, so I, I think that, that we should embark on this. It would be a, money can come from the uh, CARIP Fund, which is the uh, community, uh, the Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program which um, we have budget for that. And uh, it was four months to produce a report. And with a report showing where in the community we'd be well-placed having this infrastructure, we can use that to apply for further funding to get some of that infrastructure put in. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, yeah, final slide here. That's the, the gap analysis. We produce a map of the region showing, showing the areas that are suitable and provide a rationale for each location. And uh, yeah, on the slide, then any questions for the Drayden or myself? Okay, is there any questions from the directors? Oh gosh. <laughs> Director Knodel, go ahead. <coughs> I'd just uh, like to know if you know what the lifespan is on the average uh, vehicle battery. Uh, those are going to be the concern, I think, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll yeah. jump in on this one, Jeremy. It's, it's a very interesting question. Um, the expected lifespans that people are reporting seem to be uh, conservative, from what I can tell. For example, we've worked with Current Taxi up here in Kelowna a little bit, and the expected life of their batteries, they've absolutely crushed. They've, they've gone well above and beyond, which is very encouraging to see. Now, what will come into play in the future is, is vehicle to grid connections as well. So at some point in the future, we will have the ability to actually use our vehicles as energy storage to backfeed and either sell energy back to the utility, offset your own heat or a myriad of other cases. They're doing some studies right now in California with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, a major utility down south there, with GM, where they're actually going to try and see what it looks like to do a mass amount of vehicle to grid operations and what the effect is on the battery life. So right now, I think it's pretty conservative to say around uh, eight to 10 years is pretty common, um, but they're hoping that with some additional testing that they can bump that number up, especially once new technologies like V2G become more commonplace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Director Sentis, is your hand up? Thank you, Director. Uh, my question is one of curiosity because I have a hybrid you have compelling statistics on the electric vehicles. Do you have any sort of stats on hybrids? Um, thank you for the question, Director. I don't have any stats. Um, we have two hybrids in the fleet that we've had uh, for a year or so. We, <coughs> fuel efficiency is much, much better <laughs> okay. than other vehicles. Um, I, can, I can look into that for you if you like, but. I think there's a very compelling case where they're available to go with hybrids already. Definitely. I can add to that a little bit. When we pull our statistics for electric vehicle adoption rates, we do sometimes <coughs> include plug-in hybrids as can, they're considered in some cases zero emission vehicles. But I think if you really want to see the market and where plug-in hybrids might make the most sense, it's in an area that's going to be using non-renewable uh, forms of electricity generation. So if you look in areas that are coal generation or something like that, it makes a lot more sense because electricity generated from coal is not renewable, obviously. So the offset, the GHG offset isn't quite as impactful, obviously. So the offset, the GHG offset isn't quite as impactful. That's an area where a super efficient plug-in hybrid electric vehicle might make a lot of sense. Here in BC, where all of our energy is typically provided from hydroelectricity generation, um, you know, fully electric does make sense. If you're thinking about it specifically from 
the aspect of uh, renewable resources and offsetting GHG emissions. Thank you. Um, Director Roberts, next. Thank you. A couple of questions in regards to, um, like you were talking about distances within the regional district, uh, for instance, Manning Park, Park et cetera. Um, are there rates in regards to the idle rates in regards to vehicles, the differential, the change? We have a hot climate in the summer, uh, a cold climate in the winter. So the, the use and the draw in regards to heat and air conditioning, because again, you know, it's one thing to say go to A to B, but um, we don't necessarily strictly go A, B. There's a lot in between, and a lot of times we lose a lot of our effectiveness uh, through our idle rate. Um, yeah, thank you for thank you for that point, director. Yeah, it's a it's it's a fair it's a fair comment. There are some uh, a lot of, a lot of hills, and it's some extreme weather swings that we have here. They definitely do impact the ability of the battery to perform. That is something that the uh, the study will be considering about effectiveness in this particular region. Um, I, I suppose I would also highlight that currently you have to refuel vehicles when you're doing particularly long journeys and not just going A to B. So there's, there's already a baked in time and cost for that. Um, and that's, that's nothing new, but yeah, it, it's not going to be suitable for all vehicles and it's not going to be suitable for all journeys. I, I, I fully expect that to be the, the result of the report. I can, well, I can thank add you. a little bit to this as well here. I, I would just say in terms of the climate control, yes, in the winter, you do lose a lot of efficiency in electric vehicles. That's natural. Now, if you're going to be scoping out what vehicles to purchase as part of a fleet, I would highly recommend trying to find a platform that utilizes a heat pump, right? Similar to a heat pump in the home. They're very efficient and very good at keeping uh, the climate inside the vehicle at a, at a reasonable temperature on the condition that it's a reasonable temperature outside to some degree, right? So if you're in the minus 10, minus 15, minus 20 weather events, you're going to lose efficiency. There's no way around it. But in those moderate climates where you're, you know, maybe from five degrees down to minus five degrees, if you have a vehicle that incorporates a heat pump into its climate control, you're going to gain some efficiencies that way. So I would just recommend be knowledgeable about the vehicles that you select if you do convert. Make sure it has some of these features that I'm happy to provide other guidance on as well. Thank you. As a follow-up is, you know, some of these types of um, equipment needs, transportation, idling time, et cetera, for larger jobs. Is there, uh, with the study, looking at other options as well? So a lot of times the urban metro are, are short trips, et cetera, the EV makes sense, but are there um, openings in regards to looking at hydrogen in regards to certain types of uses? And I'm just going to throw this out, not, not in regards to it being an option, but let's say fire trucks, like a vehicle that travels very short periods of time, but has to stay idling and running pumps for great periods of time. Um, EV wouldn't, you know, in, in the long term, wouldn't be a good option. So, so I'm just going to use that as an, a use example. So is there investigations in regards to hydrogen as well as electric? Thank you. Or other of things as well. Thank you, Doctor. It's not something I'm currently looking into, but um, I'm I'm happy to happy to go back and, and see if that's something that we could uh, look to include in, in in this study or maybe future studies. Because I, I agree with you that there may be potential there. Um, we would have to look at the consideration of where hydrogen fueling is going to be as well uh, if we if we go down that route. So. Yeah, Fortis is obviously looking into hydrogen as well here for insertion into our own gas lines, but, but for hydrogen fueling as well. And one of the things that we've found is the same challenge where we need the infrastructure for refueling um, to really make it make sense. We actually do own a Toyota Mirai, I think it's called the model that actually is a, a, a hydrogen powered vehicle. We use in the lower mainland and there's no refueling stations here. I believe there were some murmurs about being one uh, created for Kelowna, which would be really encouraging to see. And there's lots of rebates available provincially and, fund, uh, and federally for that, that are incorporated into a lot of the same programs we're taking advantage of. But right now, I would I would say hydrogen's tough just because of refueling, right? There's been a lot of effort put into creating electric vehicle refueling infrastructure, and that's what makes it a feasible transition. Thank you. We'll go to Director Kozakovich now. 
Uh, great, thank you. Uh, my question is really pretty much like Director Roberts. Um, you use the word range anxiety uh, in your presentation. And I know electric vehicles can be great for um, short distances and in cities. Will the will a study give us some information on long distances and in particular when you are traveling mountain passes with uh, minus 25, minus 30 degree weather? And the reason I'm asking, I had heard some folks this past winter with the severe cold trying to get from here to Calgary but having to drive with no heat on in order to conserve battery power because they were afraid of not getting to the next charging station. So I'm just wondering if there would be some data coming out that shows how long um, your battery is going to last in certain degrees of uh, cold or, or heat if you're using AC. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just speak to the study and then I'll let Drayden speak to the sort of vehicles a little bit. Um, the study is looking at every vehicle and its actual uh, journeys and, and usage. So um, the, the temptation is to, to to always be ready for that that journey that is in minus twenty five that is long distance and and be prepared for it. And that's understandable from one to one extent, but it's it's not really. An efficient way to run a fleet when most of the journeys are much shorter than that and are not doing that kind of thing. So having having the right vehicle for the right job and, and from a fleet perspective and um, being able to right size the vehicles is, is where we're trying to get to. Yes, in some cases, absolutely, you're going to need uh, a gas vehicle for some of those journeys. Uh, that seems clear to me. Um, and safety of staff is really important. Not putting anyone in that that sort of horrible situation you described. Uh, I'll just hand over to Drayden and see if he's got any comments on, on that. Yeah, just one anecdotal comment here. My The director of business innovation at Fortis BC went down to purchase a, a Tesla Model Y, I think it was, and this happened to be right at the time of the highway uh, closed. So he was on his journey home and uh, the, the highway shut down and it ended up being, I mean, it was after the event, major, the major Coquihalla event, but there was still lots of closures during the, the whole Princeton route as well there. And he took about 10 hours to get home and he was nervous, very nervous for the exact same reasons that we've stated here um, to the point where he actually did turn down his climate control quite a bit, put on the extra jacket, put on the sweater when they were pulled over and, you know, climbed the hill, made it down and returned home with more than 30%. And that's, that's I think a big piece of that is he has a newer vehicle that has extended range and a big battery. And I think that's an important takeaway too, that, you know, if you were driving a Nissan Leaf, that's a very reasonable concern, maybe not one of the newer ones. But if you look at the battery technology that was available five years ago compared to what it is today, it's evolving so rapidly and quickly that the sizes are increasing to a point where there is less concern about that. It's definitely still something you want to think about. You want to know where your charge points are along any journey that you're taking, especially while the industry is growing. But I think as new models are coming out and as the market grows so quickly, you're starting to see more options out there that are able to alleviate that kind of concern. So yes, it's valid. But again, I kind of fall back to saying, make sure you know what you're buying. If you're going to buy an electric vehicle, buy something with a heat pump, buy something that has a big battery and buy something that can charge very quickly. There's a couple other features in there I'd recommend too. And again, I'm happy to provide guidance on that, but it's a valid concern. But I think as the market um, matures a little bit, it'll, it'll become less and less uh, concerning. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to director Knodel now. How'd you put your hand there? The, the chair. I think he did it. <laughs> There's a, a bit of anxiety too with the uh, battery because it's not like the old cars where you grab a, a gas can and go off. You got a little more of a problem if the battery goes dead. That that aside, I recently attended the BC Hydro Futures uh, uh, Symposium. Uh, and one of the things that I don't think we're considering in the grand scheme of things is our society is... Uh, uh, you know, as affluent, pampered, and privileged as we are, we're energy gluttons, uh, and the energy use is going to keep going up in this country. Um, how much are we going to have to spend on infrastructural upgrades to keep pace with our energy consumptions? The grid will have to be expanded to carry the weights, and, and the production outlets will have to keep being expanded. And as, as nice as hydro is, I do believe there's a limit to it, uh, and renewables at this time aren't exactly high megawatt outputs, if you will. 
So I'm just kind of wondering what the hidden costs are going to be, because that'll fall on all of us, what, what, no matter what we're driving. Thank you. I, I love that question, Jeremy, if you don't mind me jumping in on this. So I, just, I, was, I was desperately hoping someone would ask this exact question, because it comes up a lot, and it's a very, very reasonable concern. So first off, I'll start by saying Fortis BC and BC Hydro will always provide the energy needs of our province. We are regulated to do so. We always will. Yes, there is concerns with the electrification that's happening, not only with electric vehicles, but a lot of buildings, a lot of more heat pumps. There is mass adoption, mass uh, pressure to move towards renewable resources like hydro and push us towards electrification. So what do we do? Well, if BC Hydro and Fortis BC can do our jobs correctly, we're going to be able to create incentive programs that will mitigate the mass majority of this charging load into areas where we actually have availability in the grid as it is today. Right? The ultimate goal will actually be to increase consumption with this electric vehicle load taking place at midnight to 4 a.m. or 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. whenever we have availability in the grid without increasing demand because demand is actually what we have to build our infrastructure to. And oddly enough, if we can do that job effectively, we'll actually decrease power costs for everyone because if you can increase consumption without increasing demand, that's more revenue for, for a utility, and utilities don't make money off of power consumption, so we just set rates based on the consumption. So it's, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game there, but our intent is absolutely to be trying to control these charge events and move them into the middle of the, middle of the night when we have available capacity on the grid. And one other follow-up there is that there's obviously cases where that doesn't apply, right? What about apartment buildings? What about uh, mass DC charging areas? And what we're looking at there is uh, battery solutions or energy management systems, as they're called, that'll take in what's called DERS, Distributed Energy Resources, and it'll incorporate solar, wind on a micro scale at each site. While there's wind blowing, while there's sun shining, it'll generate electricity to be stored in batteries at site. And when people come to plug in and charge their vehicle, it's drawing from the battery, one big battery that's actually going to be doing the work of charging the vehicle itself there. This is exciting technology. There's a lot, of com a lot of companies out there trying to take advantage of this new market. In fact, we are installing our first battery storage solution at our Springfield office in Kelowna this year, where we're doing this exact thing, where people come in, they'll park their vehicles for the day, they'll go into the office, that's when the office is peaking. So we don't want to add load on top of that existing peak. So instead, we have a battery that charges up overnight, and that battery is actually what's used to charge the vehicles while everyone's working. So this is just one small example of the technology that's going to be out there today. The two answers are, uh, yes, there will be an impact, but we will shift load where we are able to. And where we aren't, we're going to use battery storage solutions and micro hydro, micro uh, solar, micro wind. And the last thing on, on other renewable resources coming out, you're right, hydro I don't think is very realistic for the, for the future of our province. Type C was a very cumbersome project to get underway there. I think if you want to look at uh, real advancement in new technologies, you want to look at um, with perhaps nuclear, which isn't popular right now, but there is small modular reactors, SMRs, that you can take a look into. Wind is another very encouraging one. We do have some high passes here in BC that could take advantage of some windy areas. So um, go ahead and add anything you want there, Jeremy. But thank you for the question, Rick. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Derek. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. We are high consumers of energy and uh, you, you are perhaps a model of the, the low energy lifestyle. By, by dialing into these meetings frequently, and it's something that we, we now have a, an option to do. And um, there's many, many, many behaviors we can do that reduce our general energy consumption. But uh, realistically, we are a huge region, and traveling around that region is, is, is inevitable um, by vehicles, and uh, we just need to find a lower carbon way to do it. A lot of the spending, a lot of the incentives will fall on the, uh, hopefully fall on the provincial and federal government who's got their budget today and they're making more money available for this kind of thing. We want to put ourselves in the best position possible to, to receive that by, by having a good, good plan and a good, uh, um, a good roadmap for, for where we want to have this infrastructure. Thank you. Um, Director Spencer Coins next. Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep it brief because we're kind of out of time. But um, first off, I just want to say your friend that uh, was coming over the Hope Princeton he doesn't have to worry. We got EV chargers from Hope all the way through Karamea, so we're we're well equipped for that. Um, that being said, though, as demand increases, and I know you you guys are looking towards the government for incentives and and all these things, but you're going to have to put in more infrastructure. How do we guarantee the price of 
uh, operating these electric cars is not going to keep going up and up and up just like it is with gasoline. Um, you know, the province and the federal government are pushing for this electric world that we're supposed to live in. And you guys can try all you want to keep up with demand, but you're going to have to keep, you know, uh, keep putting money into the infrastructure. And at some point, we're going to have to pay for that as the end users. So how do you guarantee that the price of charging your electric car is not going to catch up to the price of fueling your, your gasoline vehicle at this time? Do you want to add anything, Jeremy? Or should I, can I add? I'll, I'll just be I'll just be really brief. Um, I think it's it's difficult to make any guarantees. Nobody can tell you what the price of anything is going to be in five years' time. I don't know. Um, but uh, ECUC specifically regulate electrical supply in the province, and their mandate is to do with affordability, and uh, that's not something that can be said for for global gas prices and the global gas uh, market for oil and so on. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's difficult for me to provide any guarantees on that, but VCU see that as part of their business. Yeah, absolutely. Right. We're a very tightly regulated business, but as you pointed out, if demand increases to the point where we actually have to increase prices, we will increase prices. So there's no way to guarantee that. However, as I said, the initiatives aren't just on trying to, trying to evolve electrification or trying to evolve electric vehicles. Sorry, yeah. Uh, I'm responsible for my children today. Um, but I would say to you that we also have a large conservation and energy management effort at our business. And not only are we looking at these alternative options of battery storage and micro generation for, for micro grids, which is the way of the future there. It's generation from every source using your vehicle as a battery is another option. But we're also looking to try and make each building or each user more responsible with the energy that they are using, right? So, so it's not really an answer to say like, I'm gonna guarantee prices are gonna stay below 5% spike no matter what, but it is a way to say that we, we are all somewhat responsible for making sure that we're controlling the energy that we're using responsibly. And that means conservation and energy management efforts, as well as looking at micro generation, solar panels on the roof, battery storage, whatever it is, to try and make it a little bit easier, not only on the grid, but on your wallet as well, right? All of these options do provide some incentive, including if you allow me to control your charge event through a vehicle overnight, I'll give you a, a little bit of an incentive to do that. And eventually in the future, if you want to offset your own peak at dinner when you're cooking, doing laundry and all that, by using your vehicle battery to backfeed into your house to offset your peak, probably give you a couple bucks for that too, right? So there is going to be incentive programs that'll make it a bit easier on your wallet and it'll make it a bit easier on our grid to make the future of electrification work. And I won't go into it right now, but renewable natural gas is also a very reasonable approach to the interior that does need heating beyond what a heat pump is currently able to supply. It's a completely separate topic, so I won't go into it. But before we go too far down the road of electrification, <coughs> people should really listen, I think, to what Fortis BC is doing with renewable natural gas as well. Okay, hey, Director Holmes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so on that, for the community EV charging rates <clears throat> that are being charged. So uh, BCUC approved those rates, I presume, but uh, Fortis would have proposed them. And, and uh, that's, that's what I'm asking. And, and if, if so, what factors went into to, to establishing those rates? What are, what are the considerations? And are they, is this a provincial a wide uh, Fortis rate or is it just for this region? Oh, I, this is another great question. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> our rates were approved by the BCUC, okay? How we built our rates was to be 100% funded by the people using that charging infrastructure. If you are an EV driver, you're going to pay for the electricity that it costs, as well as the infrastructure that it took to build over the course of the lifespan of the, of the charger. We're going to call it about a 10-year lifespan of those chargers. Based on our assumed predicted charging events, we built that rate to say all of the money that was spent on putting the charging infrastructure in the ground will be recouped by the people who use it, okay? So a slow uptake at first, but by the end, we'll probably be making more money than at first. Obviously, it goes like that. We are separate from BC Hydro, completely separate. We just went through this regulatory approval process. We had ours approved. BC Hydro went through the same regulatory appro approval process. They used a different method, more backstopped by the customer. They justified it basically to say that by using more electricity, the price of power for everyone comes down. Therefore, some customers who, even if they're not EV drivers, should pay for the charger. They were denied by the BCUC. 
So their rates are still interim and they were denied on their latest uh, uh, regulatory approval process. We were approved. So a little bit different methodology. Ours were completely encapsulated. Say, if you're using the infrastructure, you will pay for the infrastructure alone. No other Fortis BC customers are doing so. BC Hydro went the other route and was denied. That being said, everyone is on their own for this industry, right? So if, if a charger is owned, even if it's in Fortis BC territory, if you park at a grocery store and the grocery store owners are the one who actually own and operate that charger, they're allowed to set the rates, whatever they want. There's, there's basically no regulation in terms of setting those rates right now, other than it has to be done on a per minute basis. You are not allowed to bill on a kilowatt hour consumption basis right now. Thank oh. you. Um, Director McCordoff, did you still have, oh, sorry, uh, Director Holmes, did you have another? Follow-up? Yeah. Are rates the same in the whole Fortis area? It's not just for our area. All of the DC fast chargers that we all own and operate are the same. So even the ones that are in municipal <clears throat> utilities like City of Penticton, City of Grand Forks, City of Nelson, where we have charging infrastructure, those are the same across the board for all of our chargers. If it's Fortis owned, that's what, it, that's what you're going to pay. Okay, thanks. Director McCordoff, did you still have a question? Question, I'm very interested in what's uh, being said today because as well as uh, uh, Director Santos, I also have a hybrid and, um, and I'm finding it uh, quite a learning experience to figure out you know, what I should do and how I can deal with it. And, uh, and so I appreciate all the information. Thank you very much. Okay, Director Vasilaki. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. A very interesting topic. Um, the, the Council of the City of Penticton is so concerned about this matter that it came to our City Council meeting this past Tuesday, um, <clears throat> where all the EVs that are owned by the City of Penticton that uh, people can hook up to in order to charge their batteries, um, we are so concerned about people we want them to, to purchase more electric vehicles that the first two hours that you hook up to the city EV units are for free. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> another two hours after that is $2 an hour, I believe, uh, for a charge. So we're taking this matter very, very seriously. And I do hope that other municipalities uh, in our region, or, but right across British Columbia, uh, put a similar process into place so that more and more people can use electric vehicles. So uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the discussion today and it's very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Director Knodel, could you make it quick because we're uh, over time. Well, certainly. Uh, one thing that I've listened to uh, come kind of to the surface here is a direction towards uh, time of use billing and that is very frightening to me given exactly what happened with the uh, two-tiered system it punished the wrong people and didn't do anything to add to uh, uh, conservation so uh, i just uh, wonder if you have a quick comment on that very very quickly i'm very aware that we've probably gone way over time thank you um yes we had a time of use billing when we brought in advanced metering we promised we would not do time of use billing and we are still planning on not doing time of use billing I think, I think it's a bit of an archaic approach to the problem that we have. If you set rates to be cheaper at 10 p.m., you're just creating a new peak at 10 p.m. I think what's better is to use the technology we have today to manually control loads. So I know when your neighborhood peaks and your neighborhood has availability between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m., that's great. We're not going to go time of use. There may be a cheaper rate at that time just for EVs. We might just give you a cash incentive to let me control the charge event. We're still working through how to build the, uh, uh, the program, the incentive program but we will not do time of use as it stands today. Thank you, sir. Uh, Director Holmes, make it quick. Please. Yeah, thank you, I'll be quick, thanks. So uh, as most people charge their EVs um, uh, at home, uh, one of the things we're talking about in Summerland is making it a requirement for all new builds to have the infrastructure in place for EV charging because um, that'll be passed on to the consumer, but it's a lot cheaper to, to put it in place, you know, as you're building a new home. Um, than trying to do it afterwards. So I'm just wondering if that's outside the scope of this gap analysis, something like that, or, or would that be looked at as well? Um, yeah, this is, that is outside the scope of this gap analysis, Director. This is purely uh, for community assets. 
All right. Yeah, that okay. being said, Fortis BC just to provide a letter of support to the city of Kelowna, who's going through the same bylaw process. So if you are looking for any kind of support or, uh, you know, I know it's the city municipality owned utility there. So if, if you're still looking for something from Fortis BC on what work we've seen in other municipalities, please feel free to reach out. I'm Summerland born and raised, so I'm passionate about uh, what's going on there. And, and Summerland's done a fantastic job of well serving the EV community. So thanks everyone for your time today. Appreciate uh, letting me talk. Thank you very much, uh, Drayden and Jeremy. Um, if no further business, I would like to get a motion to adjourn. Okay, <coughs> move. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, meeting adjourned at uh, 1027. Thank you. Yes, we have. Thank you. We will move directly into Corporate Services Committee. We have a Motion for agenda moved, seconded. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. First item on the agenda is the BC Electrical or Electoral Boundaries Commission submissions, CAO. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, we did have a previous discussion about the Electoral Boundary Commission and uh, had a few suggestions uh, that the board may want to put in some corporate recommendations to the Boundary Commission as they're going through their discussion process. And uh, I understand that we do have them lined up for an after board meeting uh, opportunity uh, with some of the panel members at least uh, today. So. Uh, we can take whatever we come up with today into that discussion later. But at the previous discussion, we did have a suggestion that we might want to ask that the uh, Penticton uh, riding be renamed to more accurately represent the municipalities that were in it. Uh, right now it is just named Penticton. Obviously it's a much bigger riding uh, than just Penticton. But the other thing that we talked about was I mean, the boundary Similkameen riding is very large and it covers uh, right from uh, the boundary area uh, up through the Similkameen. And there was a suggestion that maybe we might want to recommend a split between Okanagan and Similkameen and then let the uh, Kootenai boundary area go by themselves. So uh, those were some of the things that uh, had been under discussion, but we didn't come out with any recommendations uh, for the board to vote on uh, as far as a corporate position on these. So that's what today is about, Mr. Chair, is to uh, discuss these recommendations as well as any new ones that anybody might want to make. Okay, looking around, I'll go to Director Coyne. Yeah, I, I mean, just speaking on my end of the Similkameen Valley, I don't think we have a problem being part of the boundary Similkameen. I think if there's a change, we need to try to keep the Similkameen together. Um, this has always been a struggle in our riding. We've been on divided either one side of Headley or the other side of Headley. And now we're back together, which, which is good because our, our, our issues seem to align uh, usually around our water and, and whatever. So um, if, if, I, if there was anything I would suggest that we take to them is that the Similkameen, no matter what happens, stays in the same riding for a change instead of being split apart again, because it, it makes it frustrating when we're with Merritt one year and the next election we're with Grand Forks and <laughs> and then maybe Karameas is with Penticton. It's just, you know, there's no alignment on our, on our political or on our provincial um, needs. And then we have different MLAs that different side of the part of the floor. So it makes it difficult for us to align on things. Okay. Any other thoughts? I'll go to director Monteith. To the chair. Um, I had previously suggested that we consider Apex moving into the Penticton riding as well. Um, I did attend the uh, Penticton meeting yesterday and did share that with the commission. Um, there was a uh, residence as well as in attendance, as well as I met with after um, I attended a Apex Property Owners Association meeting, and the conversation was very rich there, and they definitely supported as a community um, moving into the Penticton riding. So um, that's something that the I know the residents are going to recommend in the feedback process. Um, they feel that aligning their services with their representation 
that would be logical for them. Okay, thanks for that. Any other points to be made? Go ahead, Director Holmes. Yeah, just in terms of renaming the Penticton um, district, it's not just to represent the municipalities in the district it, in, in the area, it's also the unincorporated areas, you know, to, rep to represent, you know, them. Then. So it's not just someone like Peachland, but, you know, I just, just to make that point. Yeah. There's Naramata, Falder, and everything yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, Director Trainer. Yeah, I'm not sure if this has been captured, um, but uh, Director Holmes had mentioned at the last meeting that it's also really important that we wanted to keep Summerland and Penticton together um, because they have a lot of the same issues and um, we are separated at the federal level and it doesn't really make sense. So um, again, I think it's important to keep um, Summerland and Penticton together um, in anything that we put forward. Okay. Looking for any more Thoughts, hands? I don't believe I'm missing anybody. So we'll put those together, CAO, and discuss it maybe with the commission or the committee when we get them later this afternoon. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Chair, uh, so we had four suggestions there. I'm wondering if we can get sort of a flavor whether there's a general support uh, on all of those. So the first one was that uh, we submit a recommendation that um, the similcamine be kept together in whatever form, uh, but that the similcamine valley be within one riding. Okay. I don't believe there's any opposition to that. I'll just See, uh, Director Roberts, are you opposing it or just want to speak to it? <laughs> I just, if we need a motion to make it carry or whatever, because I'm, I'm definitely for it. Okay, I'll, we'll just do it by consensus. If there's someone opposed, speak up and we'll go from there. Seeing no hands, we'll go to the next one then. Uh, the next proposal was that there needs to be more stability. Uh, with regards to boundary changes. So I understand that uh, the act may require a review uh, prior to or in between each election cycle. Uh, and there has been a number of uh, amendments or changes to parts of or components of uh, our area. Did we want to put forward a recommendation about some longer term planning or more stability with regards to uh, configuration or representation. I'm not sure how we'd propose that. You're meaning like to keep the regional district within one riding or, or, or at least well, a couple? Well, this was Director Coyne or Vice Chair Coyne, but I, I think it was that there's been too many changes and, and uh, well, we get... flipping around. Yeah, so I, for us, it's, you know, we were always part of Yale and then, but then Karameas would come and go or Headley would come and go out of the riding and you never know where your boundaries are anymore. It just, it makes it so you can't align at least our issues, you know, together because we would be, let's say a new Democrat and then Karameas would be in the liberal or conservative or whoever it is at the time. And then or vice versa. And it's, it makes it really hard for us to get anything accomplished there when you're such a small area and you're divided all the time because there's a hundred people here and 300 people there and they need to redraw the line to, to fit that. So that's all I was getting at. It just, it, the Samoa community needs to always kind of, I think, try to stay in the same riding so that we can, we're such a small area, but with so many similar issues around our watershed and our highway and, and whatnot. So, um, so keeping the milk mean together will yeah, solve, we'll solve, a lot solve of that. that one. I mean, right now we're divided with our school district. Our school district's with Merritt and Karamias is with, uh, what are you guys with, um, Oliver and Suez or something? Yeah. So, you know, we have no, all of our provincial stuff is divided and it just makes, makes everything difficult. Okay. Next one, CAO, was 
keeping yeah so that would be the check as to whether there's any opposition to recommending that apex be moved into the penticton writing is there anybody with any concern on that recommendation are they in boundary smoke me no i'm seeing no hands on that they one water okay <laughs> next one was keeping summerland and penticton together any opposition or thoughts on that? Again, uh, Director Monte. To the chair, I understand from the meeting yesterday, they're gonna start doing the federal boundary review as well. I'm wondering if our suggestions here would apply to the federal review as well. Possibly, yeah, Just something we So should. that we can keep those sort of ideas flowing. Yeah. Well, I got lots of different things to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a bigger discussion, I'm sure. But... West Kelowna. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no, no opposition to Penticton Summerland. What was the other one? I, off the top of my head, I'm forgetting it. We rename the Penticton. Oh, rename the Penticton one. That's right. And I think yeah, that's that sense. making sense, unless there's someone who's adamantly against it. Seeing none. So we're comfortable with that. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda then, which is Indigenous Relations. I'll go to the CAO again. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, this is a training opportunity and uh, we've come up with three different programs that we think may be of interest to uh, board. So I'm gonna turn this over to Ms. Malden. She can identify the three different levels of training and whether you're, what we're really interested in finding out is whether you're gonna participate uh, if we arrange these. So uh, that uh, is what we'll turn over to Ms. Malden to explain. Okay, go ahead, please. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, so in 2021, we started to look at increased dialogue on the impacts of the declaration at local government level. Um, and I remember saying to the board, we don't know what we don't know. Um, so we've been on a, a massive learning curve um, to try to understand what the impacts could be on local government. Um, and I know that I've shared the UBCM draft um, <clears throat> memorandum of understanding with the province. And last week I shared the action plan, um, the provincial's action, province's action plan for 2022 to 2027. Four themes there were self-determination, rights and self-government, titles and rights, um, ending racism, and embracing social, cultural, and economic well-being. So some of the elements recommended for local governments coming out of that is education and awareness, increased um, learning opportunities and interactions, relationship building with our local indigenous partners. And so keeping that in mind, our recommendation here for the rest of 2022 going forward is to embark on a, a learning opportunity. Um, and we looked at various different uh, programs, some that were a little bit um, more local focused and, and the Bob Joseph program, which I've included a link in the report is one that we thought met a lot of the needs. I know that local governments across the province are using this program and we've introduced it to staff as well through our emergency operations center. And I think it covers a lot of, a lot of material that uh, would be really beneficial to this board of directors and, and alternate directors and member municipalities and staff as well. So what I've put together is, is a recommendation that we start on this training. There's 10 different levels of training in this program. Um, the first ones are you know, broken out individually as Indigenous awareness and Indigenous relations. Those are two separate programs, two separate courses that the board could take or they could take it, you could take together combined into one, um, the Working Effectively with Indigenous People course. And I don't know if you've had any opportunity to look at these yet. So I hope the report breaks down sufficiently for you. Um, it's a 30 day session so you can we sign up and, and you have 30 days to complete the training the training uh for the combined program is six hours approximately and the resources that are available in this program the extra library materials or 
different resources that that is offered are excellent. We've gone through them. We've pulled a bunch out. We've ordered some of the, the books, the literature for our resource library as well. So what I'm looking for is some interest from the board as to whether this is something that we'd like to start with this year. And if so, is it more beneficial to take the two individual programs at three hours each, or is it more beneficial to, to invest in that six hour program, which in the end you've managed to uh, take the, the Indigenous awareness and Indigenous relations combined. Uh, I tried to put it together in, in some way that made sense here. Uh, so on that part of it, I guess what I'll do is just put it back to you, Chair, in case there's any questions on that part of it. On this? Director Sentes? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Christy, I'm just wondering, with this being an election year and the uh, composition of, uh, of the board could, could change, um, for, for staff, this is a wonderful opportunity, but I think it's a wonderful opportunity for directors as well, but we may see some change. Is it possible <laughs> to delay this um, to when you know who's going to be the board for the next four years? Any thoughts or suggestions, Ms. Moulton? Uh, we could, yes, we did talk about that as well. Uh, the board did allocate uh, some funding this year for education and, and awareness, uh, and I know that there's been a lot of requests for it this year. So I thought starting with the preliminary uh, might just give a rounded sort of um, awareness of those, those first courses. So yeah, absolutely, we could hold off on all of it, and we could take that training money and put it in for next year. Or the members who are currently here and here for the next few months could take an opportunity to take these courses. I know that they're being offered and taken in any number of different public venues as well. So it's not just specific to local government. However, um, it, it would be very helpful and geared towards elected officials. So either way, we're fine. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts on, on this? Seeing no hands, I don't, okay, Director Monteith. The chair, I really appreciate what you've done, uh, Ms. Malden. We've definitely asked for this, so I would like to see it. I know that I'm actively working on some projects, and um, I feel that the knowledge would definitely help me as well as my community. Because if I'm able to understand and share that awareness with the, my community, I think that we'll just work together better um, overall. So, whether I'm here or not, I feel like the added value, even now as I'm moving forward, would be. Appreciate it. So, okay. Good thoughts. Seeing no other hands, you want to present the next option, or was there one more? Yeah. Um, yeah, there is actually. Thanks, Chair. So, as part of the efforts um, towards better education and awareness as well, is the opportunity to invite individuals to speak at our board. And this was something that has been brought up by various directors throughout the last year. We have heard that uh, different member municipalities have had the opportunities to have speakers in and they've been meaningful and significant to that group of elected officials. And, and there was a desire to bring that to our board as well. So uh, this was something we put as part of the potential program for the rest of this year and ongoing if it's successful. And that is to invite individuals from the different Indigenous communities with stories and, and diverse experiences that they want to share with us. Um, and we could do that during lunch hour on one of the board meetings, you know, each month or as, as I guess as frequently as we can obtain speakers. <laughs> Uh, and I know Don Russell, who was working with us as an Indigenous uh, Relations Liaison, is happy to come to the board and talk about some of those basic protocols. How do you address, you know, um, how, do you, how do you acknowledge and, and speak and shake hands? And just those really basic things that can be often intimidating to various individuals when you're in a, a social setting. Um, and there to answer questions on just those basic protocols that we have. Uh, part of that will form a orientation program for new staff that come into the office, and we'd like to offer that as well to the new directors when we onboard in the new year. But in the meantime, I see value 
and, and in speaking with several directors as well, that value of the shared stories, um, often that in itself is a huge education opportunity for directors, uh, anybody really. Uh, so that was something we proposed as well as potentially that first meeting of each month or as again, as we can engage speakers uh, to provide a 45 minute opportunity, extend the lunch hour a little bit to about 45 minutes and just welcome somebody in to speak. Any thoughts on this? Director Coyne Sr., go ahead. I like that. Um, rather than, than have a structured um, system, check the boxes kind of thing, I, I mean, I don't know what those courses are. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical, but I mean, <laughs> that's just because who I am, <laughs> but, um, you know, as I said it at strategic planning, when, when we talked about this stuff, you need to get to know your neighbors. You get to, you, you've got to big start at the bottom and you've got to start to build trust. And the only way you can do that is to get to know one another. And the best way to get to know one another is to share a meal and share some stories and um, just get to know who you are and who your neighbors are because you're gonna find out a whole lot about yourself when you get start to get to know your neighbors. You're gonna find some things you don't like and you're gonna say, oh my God, I did that? Because you think in your normal life that things are just okay. And you're going to find out that you've really, really insulted your neighbors that you didn't realize that you insulted them. And I think to get to know your neighbor through a, a, a social event is a hell of a lot better than trying to do it through a structured course. And that's all I've got to say about that. You could, good thoughts. Uh, Director Coyne, senior, or Junior. Please. <laughs> well, I, I agree with senior. <laughs> um, but I, I also like, Christy, the, um, the idea of bringing uh, Don Russell in and, and just talking about protocol and just getting those, you know, those, those things worked out so people understand what protocol is and what it means. Um, I think that goes, will go a long way too. And I love the idea of the protocol binder and your report here and, um, that, I think something like that would be beneficial to everybody around this table as well as the staff just moving forward so you understand what's you know, right and what's wrong. So, thanks. Okay, good. Uh, Director Roberts and then Director Trainer. Thank you. And as a follow up to the coins, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I'd like to see whether or not we make a motion to have the starting of the informal get to know your neighbor um, process and maybe the policy manual as things go. And I think that was as we move forward, getting to know those from our, our, the different communities around us, then if we hold off on the online program until the, the new group, it would provide context. We've got a little bit more of a relationship built up. We'll be able to understand what you know what to take home what works what doesn't and have it in context with what we've had with our discussions with community so that's my uh motion that we initiate the series of guest speakers um that we look at the policy uh book as it was just brought up by uh director coins uh, jr and then that we put off the you know start it for the new the new board whoever's left the online but any of those of us that have started to create these relationships will be moving forward and that the guest process itself keeps on going. It's not something that's just going to be a one-time deal. It's an ongoing process. So it's something that the next board will be um, privy to and learn from and develop relationships with as well. Okay. So I hear that motion. Is there a seconder for that? Okay. Seconded. So it's on the floor. I'll go to Director Trainer. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think I've said this before, but um, Anola Campy from the Penticton Indian Band has come to talk to um, Summerland Council twice. And I really enjoy her presentations. Um, one was about culture and one was about residential schools. And she has a really um, kind and um, impactful way of sharing stories. And I just, I learned so much, not only as um, a local politician, but also as like a resident of the Okanagan. I just learned um, about the people that were here before us and, and um, you know, what they believe in and how they see the world. And it was, it was just so good. And I think that this board would really enjoy her. Um, she's such a good storyteller and she's used to talking to kids. Um, and so she just, she's a really nice person. And so I think that bringing her here over a lunchtime period would be really good for us, especially um, once we go back to in-person meetings. Um, I know she likes to do in thing, things in person. And um, so I, I just think it would be really good to invite her to come and speak. And then also um, like Director Coyne was saying, um, some, having somebody come in and talk about protocol would be really good. I, I need to learn a lot about that. So for me as a director, that would be really, really helpful. So those are my suggestions. Dr. Robinson, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just recently uh, at OUC here in Penticton, Clarence Louis came uh, to speak uh, regarding his new book, The Res Rules. Uh, anybody who hasn't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's very entertaining and uh, really informative. Uh, I think most of the councillors from Penticton uh, actually were at that, but uh, I'd be more than happy to hear him speak again and perhaps somebody from PIB, and I agree 100% on uh, protocol would be nice to have a go over that as well. Thanks. Okay. Good comments, Director Holmes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, since we're in the we're in the business of governance, I guess uh, uh, you know one thing I've heard, and I'm sure all of us heard, in the, uh, is, is about how we always expect Indigenous people to fit into our governance model. How they how that we expect them to to uh, come to our institutions and, and our meetings and everything, rather than us you know turn around and, and try to fit into their um, governance model. And I, I think a lot of us, we attended that ONA uh, workshop uh, in June of last year. Uh, it was a Zoom one. And uh, Gwen Bridge, uh, it, was, it was really fascinating. She compared um, our governance models to most Indigenous people's governance models in North America. And, you know, we kind of started at the same place. We have God on top. They have, they have the creator on top. But after that... You know, so so we have the crown, which derives its authority from from God, and below that we have um, the, the con or constitution, and below that legislation. Whereas the most indigenous peoples, they have the creator on top, and and below that is the earth or land, the land, and and from that um, stories are derived, and from that protocols are established, and that's their governance model. So I think it's really important that we learn, we hear those stories, and we hear, we know those protocols, because that's where, that's the only way the two, our two competing, you know, off, governance models that are often at odd can, that's, can have somehow come together. And, and I think that's uh, what we've been trying to do a little bit in Summerland, is try to hear those stories and, and the protocols so we can understand them, because it, until we understand those and know them, and, um, we're not going to get very far. So I, I, I love this idea of people coming in and telling the stories and, and, and the protocols that come from those stories. So we, you know, because we have to knock ourselves over the head sometimes to make it that understood. But I, I don't know if 45 minutes over lunch will be enough. Yeah. You know, I, I think we might need, you, you might need to set longer periods of time to do it. Yeah, well, that's a, a good thought and good suggestion. Any other hands or thoughts on this? We I don't want to miss anything. We do have the motion on the floor to start this lunch or otherwise. We can do it during a committee meeting if we have to. If Maybe we try it with a lunch speaker and if it doesn't seem to work out, we can expand it or something. But we'll go from there. I'll call the question then on the motion. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. 
Thank you very much. And I think that gives you enough direction, Ms. Molden. Certainly does. Thank you. All right. Great. So moving on on our agenda, the next item is a closed session. So we will have to give Danny a minute to make it closed and keep everybody else that's supposed to be online on. Motion moved, seconder, thank you. All those in favor of adoption, thank you. Any opposed? Again, motion carries. That brings us down to development services. Item B1, Agricultural Land Commission, Electoral Area A, CAO. Oh, Thanks, before, I go to the, before I go to the CAO, I should let everybody know that we do have uh, MLA Ashton in the room with us as a guest. You don't see him on your screen, but he is here listening. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, please, CAO. <laughs> We won't read into that uh, reference that he's not listening, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks. So uh, this is a referral from the Agricultural Land Commission for an owner who wants to build a new dwelling but leave the existing dwelling uh, on the property. So uh, right now, uh, he, there is already an existing dwelling on the property and there's a packing building and there's a couple of sheds. The uh, ALC regulations only allow uh, one dwelling. So uh, in this case, uh, it's, a, it's a farmer that wants to build a new house but uh, use his current house for farm worker accommodation. And it is compliant with our zoning bylaw, it's just uh, not compliant with the ALC rigs. So we're recommending that this be authorized to proceed to the ALC, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Director Tim Schwartz, please go ahead. <laughs> Getting all tongue-tied here. Director Roberts. I'm not making the motion, I'm just wanting to um, uh, speak clarity. Uh, I just recently was in conversation with the ALC and there has been a recent change in regards to there being allowed two residents. It's just uh, tied to sizes. Is, is that something that just hasn't come down through to staff yet? Or is this, this me getting a little further information is something that's coming? I'm not sure. Maybe the CAO can answer that. Uh, I think I'll refer this to Mr. Garish, Mr. Chair. I'm not really up on the new ALC. They keep changing so quickly these days. I'm not up on them either. Okay. Mr. Garish? Sure, thank you. So, uh, yes, the ALC did change the regulations on December 31st. And they do allow for uh, one accessory dwelling uh, with land commission approval on a parcel now. Uh, but the proviso is uh, the floor area of that dwelling unit not exceed uh, 90 square meters. And if I recall this particular application correctly, um, the dwelling unit complies with our allowance, which is for one accessory dwelling with a floor area not exceeding 125 square meters, uh, but it exceeds the 90 square meters the Land Commission require or allows for, so hence it needs their approval. Okay, so it has to go to them for approval. Okay, looking for someone to please make that motion. Moved, seconded, thank you. Any further discussion? Not seeing any hands, I've got to double check. I'll call the question. This is a rural, actually it's saying oh, it's corporate. corporate vote. So just so everybody's aware, corporate vote, all those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Question for Mr. Canodal, Director Canodal, I think. Was that a question from? That was a vote. That was a vote. Oh, that was your vote. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. B2, Parkland Dedication, CAO. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So this is uh, an application. Uh, for development in uh, the Naramata Benchlands area. 
and it's for that 41 lot subdivision and uh, there are uh, developers ready to go on that right now and the question left outstanding is do we accept parkland or do we accept uh, cash in lieu of parkland uh, and uh, the recommendation is for cash in lieu uh, but I, I have to say at the start uh, Mr. Chair that uh, the developer has questioned uh, part of our report in uh, uh, the recommendation from the Naramata Parks and Recreation Commission to accept cash in lieu instead of uh, land uh, indicated that the property wasn't suitable for park. Uh, first of all, it's not adjacent to water, but secondly, uh, the uh, land area is geotechnically unstable and the developer uh, has uh, submitted and rightfully so uh, there has been no geotechnical report on that area and that uh, comment is inappropriate uh, may affect his lot sales in the future so uh, we're going to retract that and take that out of our records uh, Mr. Chair but having said that uh, we are recommending that we go ahead and uh, accept cash in lieu of parkland uh, for this outlook subdivision and uh, uh, stipulate that there was an appraisal submitted uh, that values it at $104,000. And uh, the only st other stipulation is that we want that money within six months or uh, with the volatile nature of uh, land values uh, that may become uh, outdated if longer than that. So that's our recommendation, Mr. Chair, is that we take the cash in lieu, uh, value it at 104,000, but we get it in six months. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Kozakovich. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the administrative recommendation. Okay, moved and seconded. Thank you. Any discussion on this? Making sure I'm seeing. Okay, Director Coyne Sr., go ahead. So, ran into this before. Um, is, is there a if it's not geotactical, is there a real good reason why we're not taking the the land? Um, you know, Heritage Kill, Hills comes to mind pretty quick with this um, taking the cash in lieu thing, and then are, are the residents going to eventually end up having to buy back to put in green space, or is there already green space built in? Or that's my question. Okay, can either CAO or Director Kazakovich, she got her hand up, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Director Coyne. We do have a large amount of parkland in Naramata. We have five parks and I think as the board knows, we've purchased more parkland over the, the past um, eight years. So we do have a large amount of parkland. That being said, we did go on site. Uh, the majority of the Parks and Rec Commission members attended with me uh, on a couple different occasions to look at the parcel of land. And while there could be some uses there, it is quite a ways up the uh, hillside. And there is proximity to the KBR. It would, it would really have looked more like um, an area where you could park maybe a couple of picnic tables, but you'd be venturing off onto the KVR trail. We already have uh, parking lots and, and other areas with parking lots, picnic tables and washrooms. So um, the Parks and Rec Commission felt that they did not need another piece of parkland to look after, that we have an awful lot of parkland currently that we need to do our upgrades on and wanted to have the cash in lieu to be part of our parkland acquisition fund to build that back up as well. It, it it's sort of was drained down to almost nothing. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Director Coyne? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, any further discussion on this? Again, seeing no hands, this is again a corporate vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. B3, development variance in electoral area D, CAO. Yeah, so this is an application uh, to build an accessory building in the upper Carmi area, uh, Mr. Chair. And 
Uh, the zoning bylaw does permit an accessory dwelling in that area uh, with a deck. It permits an accessory building in that area, but does not allow for a deck. And uh, the concern in this particular application is that it's a, a two-story garage, uh, workshop, uh, office type of configuration, uh, which doesn't allow for a deck. And we're concerned that uh, it's uh, built like a deck, uh, or sorry, built like a, a dwelling, uh, looks like a dwelling, and we're concerned that it may turn into a dwelling in the future. And if that's the case, uh, the applicant should be uh, applying for an accessory dwelling, not an accessory building. So we're recommending that the application to add a deck to the accessory building be denied. Okay. I would uh, have to, at this point, as it's a motion or a recommended motion to deny, ask if the applicant is available and wishes to speak to this. Um, can we I just have... ask, Mr. Chair, should, should we not put a motion on the floor uh, prior to asking the applicant to speak? Well, I guess we can do that if the applicant or the alternate director is available for that, please. Thank you. Would you Thank you, be Chair. Here? My motion would be to um, recommend the alternative motion from the administration to approve the development uh, of the variance, the development of the deck okay. and the variance. All right, so you're making the motion to, you to you're making the motion to approve. I see a seconder for that. Any discussion on this? <clears throat> My if notes. I may, go ahead, if please, I may, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, in reading the the staff report, the intent of prohibiting decks is to discourage conversion to an accessory dwelling, but you are allowed to have accessory dwellings. And in this case, the floor plans don't include the installation of a kitchen or washrooms or water, septic, those types of things. So the report indicates as well that putting the deck on is not going to immediately um, <clears throat> result in the conversion to a dwelling. And that the purpose of this dwelling is to for, for uh, saddle making and for leather works, which are best done outside to avoid some of the fumes. So. It seems to me that what the applicant is doing here is wanting to put a deck on outside of a, uh, a building that they're going to be doing some some leather work in so that they can perform those functions outside. And it seems to me that we've got some rules that they want to go into a an accessory dwelling. They're going to have to comply with all the other rules and regulations. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. I see a hand from Director Bush. Go ahead. Yeah, so I would agree with uh, going ahead with the deck and, uh, you know, if down the road that somebody wants to make a secondary dwelling, then that would be a different discussion. But for now, I think I don't see any problem with the deck. Fair enough. Any other discussion on this? Seeing no hands, this is a rural vote. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. B4, another development variance, this time from electoral area E. Go ahead, CAO. This is an application for a variance to a rear yard uh, at Workman Place from 10.5 meters to 2.5 meters and a variance from the side yard uh, from 4.5 meters to 1.5 meters. And uh, we're going to recommend against this one, Mr. Chair, just uh, from the fact that we did a blanket uh, variance to reduce front yards and extend backyards because of slope uh, issues previously. And then this now uh, takes that extended backyard and encroaches uh, into the setback on that. So we're not in favor of that, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'll go to Director Kazakovich. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the administrative recommendation. Okay, you're moving it. Is there a seconder? Seeing a seconder, thank you. And this being a motion to deny, we will ask if the applicant is on line and wishes to speak to it. 
And he's nodding his head yes, so please, if he's avail he or she is available, please go ahead. Hi. Hi, everyone. We can just hear you. Could we get the volume a little bit higher? Yes. Hi, my name is Sajad Kimanish. I'm uh, here on behalf of my clients on that property, uh, 2573 Workman Place. Uh, what we... Uh, would do uh, at that corner of the uh, property is just the different elevation between backyard and the side of the backyard and side of the swimming pool. Uh, uh, we're not going to build anything like, uh, it's just the uh, landscaping purpose. Like we just want to uh, resolve that uh, different elevation about 48, 49 inches between the backyard and the side of that we have a, a water management pond on the south side. So uh, there is a 45 inches difference between the backyard. So it's nothing like there is an alternative that we can build the uh, landscaping wall and backfill it, but we prefer to be efficient and uh, keep it light construction, just we would like to build a small deck on the side of the swimming pool and backyard to uh, make it flat backyard for them. Okay, I'll ask the board if they have any questions for the applicant or his agent. Seeing any questions? All right, I see no hands. Thank you for the brief presentation on what you're trying to do. We do have the motion on the floor. Is there any discussion on that motion? Director Kozakovich, go ahead. Yeah, just, just to clarify for the board, um, you know, in the report you can see that um, you know, the applicant has indicated that there's the unpleasant view of, of the um, water pond next door, that, which is for stormwater collection. You know, uh, that would be known at the time of purchasing this lot. It, you know, that was already there, that existed. We specifically have been trying to protect, protect the KVR trail, which uh, runs along there, and our setbacks were put in place for that. This is a large setback reduction, um, the rear parcel line and exterior side parcel line. And we have received opposition to this. And so I don't think it's fair to allow one property owner to do this when the whole stretch along there is not able to do this uh, specifically because the request was to protect the um, aesthetics of the KVR trail, which is immediately below this property and others along there. So uh, I cannot support this uh, reduction. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Any further discussion? Seeing no hands, I'll call the question. Again, this is a rural vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Director Bush is opposed. Motion carries. Petition to enter fire service, I believe. This is in electoral area H, CAO. Yeah, this is just uh, 14 properties that have petitioned into the Area H Water uh, Service, Mr. Chair, that we've talked about before, and we're recommending that that now be adopted. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Director Coyne, please. Yes, I'd like to make the administrative recommendation, please. Okay, okay. moved, seconded. Any discussion on this? Seeing no hands, I believe this is just for adoption, so it's been discussed. Yeah. A petition is a corporate vote, so call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Over to B6, an OCP amendments and elect areas A, C, D, E, F, H, and I. CAO. Yeah, so this is our effort to close that gap between 
uh, board expectations for uh, farm worker accommodation, Mr. Chair, and what we've got in some of our zoning bylaws uh, that permit farm worker accommodation. And uh, the board's aware that uh, there's been some changes uh, in ALC regulations over the last few years. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, applications, for, especially in area C for farm worker accommodation uh, that have been coming in. And uh, the board was in favor of those and we've recommended against be simply because uh, they were contrary to the existing wording uh, in the bylaw. So uh, it took us a while, but we've now got a proposal to uh, try and close that gap. And they've been out to the advisory planning commissions around uh, the regional district. Uh, and we seem to have uh, some agreement on uh, the way that we're going. So uh, we're recommending uh, that we do amend uh, the OCP bylaws to uh, uh, include these TUP and, and the mechanism we're using as a temporary use permit uh, to include these uh, mechanisms for farm worker accommodation and uh, that we set a public hearing uh, date of May 5th before the board. Okay, looking for a direction from the board on this. Go to Director Knodel. I think you were muted there, Director Knodel. I'd like to move uh, the recommendation, please. Okay, thank you for that. A seconder. Yeah. Great. Any discussion on this? Seeing no hands, rural vote, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Down to B7, watercourse development permit update, CAO. Yeah, this is a similar uh, effort uh, to address watercourse development permit uh, policies, Mr. Chair. So we're recommending uh, first and second reading to amend the official community plan to include these, but then also uh, we need some changes in our uh, development procedures bylaw uh, in order to address it. This is uh, one where, uh, uh, I mean, it, it goes back to 2005 when the repairing area regulations were first established, and then uh, we changed our development procedures bylaw to uh, adjust to the uh, RAR regulation. And uh, at that, that's the time when uh, the emphasis of the onus was put on qualified environmental professionals to a sort of a self-regulated uh, uh, industry to uh, be the re, uh, responsible parties to go out and investigate what the uh, changes in the RAR were and uh, which was all fine and good. And then finally, uh, the province has indicated they weren't completely satisfied with some of the reports that were coming in and the changes made. So they they changed the riparian area regulation uh, in 2019 to this riparian area protection regulation, uh, and uh, which uh, really changes it to say that uh, local governments can't approve changes within the RAR uh, without provincial government notification that it was an appropriate uh, uh, change. So QEPs still submit the reports, but we can't go ahead on those uh, until the province says that they accept them. So at the same time, uh, they said they weren't going to approve anything retroactively. So for us, we have this one example in Area E uh, where... Uh, a property owner uh, wants to make uh, some changes within the RAR, uh, good changes, uh, but there was no mechanism uh, to do uh, retroactive approvals. So this is us now uh, bringing forward the changes to uh, our official community plans and then changing our development procedures bylaw uh, because the, pro the province said, well, we can't give you permission to do anything retroactively, just go to your local government. And as long as they've got the appropriate procedures in place, they can do it. So uh, anyway, long story short, this uh, concludes uh, that for us, uh, Mr. Chair, and that uh, if we can get first and second reading 
on the official community plans and first and second reading on our development procedures bylaw. We believe that this can be addressed. So we're recommending that and that we have a hearing before the board on May 5th. Correction from the board on this. Someone wanting to move it. Moved. A seconder. Thank you. Any discussion? Making sure I not missing any hands. <clears throat> Seeing none. Again, a roll vote. All those in favor. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. B8. Okanagan Valley Zoning Bylaws, <coughs> CAO. Uh, this was the subject of your public hearing this morning, uh, Mr. Chair. This is our consolidation of uh, zoning bylaws uh, in the Okanagan Valley. And we are now at the point uh, where uh, we can, uh, that we can recommend the uh, OCP and the uh, zoning bylaw amendments um, for uh, and the bylaw notice uh, the the OCP and the bylaw uh, notice enforcement bylaw they're just housekeeping changes to keep up with the uh, changes on the uh, consolidated zoning bylaw uh, of all these changes that we're making so we're recommending that uh, these all get third reading Mr. Chair. Okay direction on this someone willing to make that motion thank you a seconder Seeing any hands, thank you for that discussion. <coughs> this one's been a long time in coming to this point. <laughs> I would hate to recall what year this started, but I see a big smile from Mr. Garrish if this keeps moving forward. <laughs> Seeing no discussion, I will call the question. Again, this is a rural vote. All those in favor? <coughs> Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. One step closer. B9, official community plan amendment in electoral area D, CAO. Uh, we're going to ask that this be uh, uh, postponed, Mr. Chair. We had a confusion uh, on the agenda with the notice for the public hearing. It was scheduled uh, for today, but the agenda didn't really reflect that. So uh, what we're going to ask for is, uh, this is the, the triggers for development in the multifamily and industrial zones in area D. And uh, what we're going to ask for is that we get a motion to reset the public hearing. And I believe Mr. Garish uh, sent out an email uh, with his uh, proposed um, date uh, I do remember seeing that, but I don't have the date. So if you can. Mr. Garish, can you give us a date then? Uh, yes, we're, we're proposing that the, the public hearing be rescheduled for May 5th. So for May 5th? Uh, yeah. So what we'd like okay. to propose, I got it here now. Uh, what we'd like to propose is that uh, uh, instead of this recommendation that you see on your agenda, is that we say uh, the holding of a public hearing uh, because it already is sitting at second reading, uh, we just need the public hearing. That the holding of a public hearing for the electoral area D official community plan amendment bylaw um, uh, be scheduled for the regional district board meeting of May 5th, 2022, and that staff give notice of the public hearing in accordance with the local government act. And that's our recommendation, okay. Mr. Chair. All right, looking for a motion on that. Thank you. Uh, any seconders? Thank you. Discussion on this should be fairly straightforward. Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. B10. No, there is no B10. There's no items removed from consent agenda. So down to protective services. Community emergency Preparedness Fund, CAO. Yeah, so we have two uh, grants 
or sorry, two issues uh, under protective services, Mr. Chair. The Community Emergency Preparedness Fund uh, is again offering uh, grants for training and exercising and EOC improvements. Uh, we've uh, received funds under this program uh, in 2021. This is the 2022 phase. Uh, so we are recommending that we submit an application uh, to the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund for training and exercising in order to get those 2022, uh, that 2022 grant. Correction from the board on this? Moved. moved. Thank you. A seconder. Thank you. Discussion? Again, this is fairly straightforward and it's a corporate vote. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Next one. Award of a contract for the Emergency Operations Centre Training, CAO. Yeah, and I should have said on that previous one, the 2022 uh, application is for $99,000, uh, Mr. Chair, and it's in partnership with Summerland, Oliver, and Karameas. This Good next one, yeah, uh, this next one is the award of funds from under the 2021 grant that we got. And uh, uh, for this one, and we had this at committee, this is the, uh, uh, was at uh, the March 17th committee uh, for discussion. Um, but what we're recommending is that we award a contract, um, I think it's to Red Dragon, Red Dragon Consulting uh, for $69,000. And that's for uh, training and exercising. Okay, thank you. Someone willing to move it? Move. Thank you. A seconder? Thank you. Any discussion? Again, seeing no hands, corporate vote, all those in favor? Thank you, any opposed? Motion carries. Down to finance, Naramata fire truck purchase, CAO. Yeah, this is for a bush truck, uh, Mr. Chair. We're recommending that the uh, contract be awarded <clears throat> to commercial emergency equipment for $150,000. Okay, Director Kazakovich, direction on this? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the administrative recommendation. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? Again, seeing no hands. And this is corporate vote. Call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Opposed? Motion carries. Area B Community Works, CAO. Yeah, this is to uh, withdraw funds from the Area B Community Works Program uh, Fund, Mr. Chair, for $75,000. And this is for the uh, cost and trail. And we're recommending four readings. Okay, thank you. Director Bush? I'd like to move this uh, recommendation. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any discussion on this? Looks fairly straightforward. Call the question again, a corporate vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Another down to legislative services, but electoral area G community works, gas tax expenditure, CAO. Yeah, and this is for the uh, Karameas Irrigation District to upgrade their electrical system. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're recommending for a reading. Okay, I'll go to Director Roberts. Moving it, thank you, seconded, perfect. Any discussion on this one? Again, seeing no hands, and again, a corporate vote. All those in favor, thank you. Any opposed, motion carries. That brings us down to the CAO reports, CAO. Um, uh, just uh, an update from the chair CAO forum. Uh, that we attended in Victoria uh, back on March uh, 22nd, 23rd, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, uh, and you can help me answer any questions uh, that come up, but uh, we did have a, we did have a presentation from the um, Ministry of Agriculture with regards to the egregious flooding that occurred uh, in November, December. 
and what they believe their part in uh, sitting in emergency operations centers with local governments is. And uh, they made uh, um, really good uh, submission as to how they can be involved and how they can assist local governments when this type of uh, uh, intrusion on our farms is concerned. So uh, we got some good information out of that. And uh, they also talked about some of the recovery activities uh, from those events, and not just in the Fraser Valley, but from all over uh, the province. Uh, they specifically referred to uh, assistance that they gave uh, um, uh, during the twenty uh, during the fires in previous years and local ELCs as well. Uh, so that's always good. Uh, always uh, taking care of animals and the need for farmers to uh, whether these types of events uh, on site in order to take care of their, their animals uh, was uh, eye-opening. So uh, that was good. We had a, a legal update from Young Anderson on some of the more recent cases that came up uh, affecting local governments and uh, uh, some good uh, discussion on that. Uh, we did have uh, the ALC. These aren't in order. We had a couple of these presenters that either opted in or opted out uh, at the time, but uh, we did get a presentation from the Agricultural Land Commission um, just on updates on some of their regulatory changes. Uh, so that was good. Uh, so not much that I'll, I'll give on that one, other than the fact that we now have invited the ALC to appear before the board uh, to discuss more our issues. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure they'll elaborate on some of their legislative changes uh, at that time as well. We had EMBC there. Uh, talking about uh, uh, what they now consider uh, just really the norm rather than uh, changes with regards to climate change and how they're adapting their organization uh, to these extended uh, uh, provincial and local government events. Uh, so, uh, and their intention to be more collaborative and to be more supportive of local EOCs uh, so we had that one, and then uh, we had the new Minister of Municipal Affairs, Minister Cullen, uh, appeared before the group, and uh, uh, seems like a personal man, and uh, gave his idea of some of the projects that are upcoming on his docket, uh, some of the legislative changes, talked a lot about the local government elections coming up uh, in the fall, uh, so that was uh, interesting. We had uh, the Ministry of Transportation there uh, talking about uh, their recovery efforts out of the November, December floods uh, and uh, where they are uh, right now and how they, uh, their priority was on getting the uh, numbered highways back open and uh, the success that they've had and the cooperation that they've had uh, from contractors in order to allow them to do that in a short period of time. Uh, so that was good. Uh, we had a, um, a presentation from Ecom, who, for those uh, that may not know, uh, uh, really operates the primary operations center for emergency telecommunications, so E911, uh, talking about the next generation of uh, emergency dispatch, so uh, 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 changing their uh, technology to include cell phones and uh, better addressing off mobile phones. Uh, and uh, we know that that's been extended. Uh, the, the contracts have been extended over the last few years. They're still trying to get this technology identified and then putting a cost on what that might look like. Uh, in the meantime, we've been ongoing uh, updating the contract on an annual basis, but that will soon be ready uh, to go to the more extended uh, contracts. And uh, for us, uh, we contract with Ecom e uh, through Central Okanagan Regional District. And then we have our second dairy uh, ops uh, for fire dispatch through the city of Kelowna. And then there was the typical nuts and bolts section uh, and uh, had uh, discussed various issues there. And uh, that was it, Mr. Chair. For that, any questions, Director Holmes? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just want to follow up of CAO when he mentioned that the new Minister of Municipal Affairs, 
updated, uh, gave his priorities on his docket. I was just wondering, are those the same priorities as the previous minister? And, and so when there's a, a cabinet shuffle like that, does the mandate letter from the previous minister just carry on over to the new minister or does he get a new mandate letter? Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, should I answer on Go that ahead. one? Uh, yeah, he didn't, really, he didn't really talk about the mandate letter so much. That does stay the same. Uh, he, uh, he was talking more about continuing uh, the collaboration with local governments that the previous uh, minister had started. Uh, uh, the board will be familiar with those monthly or uh, during the pandemic, even more regular uh, telephone uh, teleconferencing opportunities with the Minister for Local Government. So Minister uh, Cullen continues to uh, do those. He's uh, scheduled one already. Uh, and he's going to rely on uh, the local government representatives to help him identify what the issues are and to try and be very responsive to what the issues uh, uh, that are coming up. So not so much a change on the mandate, but uh, just uh, how he intends to operate within that ministry. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Seeing no hands, we'll move along. Uh, chair's report. I was at that CAO Chair's Forum as well and attended the MFA shortly after, the, well, the next day after that. Uh, and I'll report on MFA at the next meeting because there's a section for that. But I would just add the one thing that I that stuck out as quite important to me is what changes were potentially coming was the notification systems when there's these emergencies and big disasters are going to be similar. I'm not sure if it's happening immediately, but it's in the, the works is similar to the way you get like an Amber alert when there's a child been abducted, it comes onto your phone automatically and it will interrupt TV and radio broadcasts and potentially letting everybody know that there's something happening that could be life-threatening. So to me, I thought that's maybe a good change to see happening and I'm glad that it's in the works. So, Otherwise, I don't have a whole lot to report. I've attended several of these meetings with ministers and attended one yesterday again with Emergency Management BC in their updates. And I think there was several of you guys on there as well. So. I won't elaborate on that. There wasn't a great deal to report out of that either. So we'll go to director's motions. Director Canodal, you had a motion, but I understand you'd like to postpone that? Yes, uh, to the chair, it, it seems I managed to pick something a little more complicated than it sounds. And uh, through staff, we've uh, request that it be postponed until the first meeting in May, which would be May 5th. Okay, so motion to postpone till the 5th of May. Seconded, thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great, any opposed? Motion carries. Another notice of motion was from Director Oberick in area D and I understand he would like to? That's correct, Mr. Chair, you would like to uh, postpone that to the next meeting. To the next meeting, Absolutely. that would be April 21st meeting? Correct. Okay, so a motion to put it on that docket. Seconded, thank you. Discussion? Seeing no hands, call the question. All in favor? Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Final item, board members' verbal updates. Anybody have anything they wanted to bring to the attention of the board or remind the board of. Director Coyne, senior, please go ahead. So this is gonna be my last meeting with the board for some time. My, um, my alternate will be taken over for me. Um, Linda Allison. Linda's very, very experienced. She's a former board member and has uh, 
extensive uh, experience in local government as well as uh, federal stuff dealing with the Cattlemen's Association and, and President of Canada Beef for a number of years. Um, yeah, so I will still be active um, doing other things, but I will not be attending any meetings. We have a serious family health issue. So anyways, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you for that. And our thoughts and prayers are with you and the family for sure on that. Anybody else have any items they want to bring to the board's attention? Announcements? Go ahead, Director Johansson. Uh, I'll just say that on March 25th, the Suez and Oliver had a C2C with the Suez Indian Band. Um, just building on past relationships and looking to improve relationships moving forward. We did, we did come out of the meeting with some common goals and a couple of projects that we'll be working on. So again, I would just recommend with anybody on the board here, if you're able to set up a community to community meeting with uh, a local band in your area, it's a, definitely a great way to go and, and get to know more and get to know people in a less sort of a less formal, uh, atmosphere and have better conversation and just get to know people so thank you okay thank you for that any other verbal updates director bush and then director kazakovich uh, yes uh, director roberts and director bauer and i had a great um, mind tour visit yesterday and uh, we got to watch the new trolley um u-haul trucks that are that are now running on electricity and it's uh, quite a it was a very interesting uh, tour and uh, I'd also like to wish Bob Coyne and his family the best. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that, Director Kazakovich. Uh, yes, thank you to the chair. It was just a follow up to what uh, Director Johansson updated on. I was just curious if the uh, area A and C directors were part of that C to C. Uh, yeah, Director Knodel and Director Pendergraf were both invited. Uh, Director Knodel was unable to attend, and uh, Director Pendergraf, I believe, in Vancouver at the time. Yeah, I was at so the Chairs and CAO Forum. Sarah Foss, I believe, attended on behalf of the Regional District. Um, but yes, they were, they were part of that as well. Okay, perfect. Director Knodel, I see a hand from you. It's just to further that discussion. We did send Sarah in, in our stead for the two of us because we knew we wouldn't be available and we will be getting a, a, an update this afternoon from her on that uh, briefing on how the C to C discussion went. Thank you. Okay. Any other verbal updates? Seeing none, we are at the end of the agenda here. I'm looking for a motion to... Adjourn. Lots of hands. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor. We are adjourned. I will remind the board, though, there is an opportunity to hear from the Boundary Commission folks, and I believe we're going to try to get them on early if that will work. So if you want to stick around and give us a couple of minutes, and Christy said she can get them on early, so we'll see if that happens. So not everybody sign off. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye.